Someone I love once held so tight The screens will follow me Cries of my ancestors said Go away A part of the dark creation My desires performing incantations I walk in disguise If I catch you, it's your demise Shamanism, of my religion, summoning spirits Manifesting myself and changing my flesh A nightmare to behold I'ma make you part of the fold The skin of a man, the soul of a predator The change is complete, this thing I become Okay, folks, welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. That was the song called Bad Medicine. And as you can hear it, you can do the math. It was about us, uh, what we call the skinwalker, but it's a little more to it than that. There's a lot of different names for these, uh, these beings and these people that do these things. They're not all just skinwalkers. Uh, they call them that by the Navajo term, but there's other, there's other things that you can call them. I call it bad medicine. So let's get started here. <clears throat> Tonight, tonight's chat, we are going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, and I, if, if you joined us from Blondes and Booze, let me go ahead and bring uh, our guests on, our roundtable, our co-hosts, if you will. How's everybody doing tonight? Great. How are you? Oh, Fantastic. <laughs> Looks like Abe's got a, an extra person there. <laughs> there... So, so if 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 you guys are just joining us, we, I was on Blondes and Booze earlier with with Krista mm -hmm. and Brandy, and we were talking about Native American shapeshifters, uh, shapeshifters, and and uh, um, you know, it, it, but people, it's, especially with the the ghost community, I've had some people come at me and say. Well, stop saying skinwalker because not all Native Americans call them skinwalkers. No, they don't all call them skinwalkers, but they yeah. all have a, they all have something that they refer mm -hmm. to. And I would I don't know, that's the 
term. It's like calling a soda a a Coca Cola. It's still a to me, it's still a Coke. I mean, you know, it's right. right. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Yep. Absolutely. How are you, Monica? Good to see you. Uh, I'm doing good. How are you, Krista? Doing good. It's awesome. Muted. Let me see. Yeah. Looks like Abe's trying to get settled, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Well, once we get everybody in here, I know that Joe's supposed to be joining us too. And when he gets in, we, we're, we're not even, we're at 263 now. Wait till about 300 mm-hmm. before we start cracking them. Yep. So how was you guys, uh, how was your day? How's it? Was it hectic like mine? Or? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, I think uh, we, Brandy and I were talking before you hopped on our show, just that like it's in the air, like people are weird, you know, with everything going on and yeah. yeah. So somebody it's just a very Brian stressful Bowden, day. Yeah, it's been a stressful day for me big yeah. time. Uh, Brian <laughs> Bowden had messaged, uh, sent to put a message on there on Facebook saying, "Be careful because Mercury's in like retrograde or something." Yep. Yep. So it said from the first to the twenty fifth. Yep. It's just gonna suck. I'm like, wow, twenty five. Always in retrograde. Yeah. <laughs> it feels yeah. like it's always in retrograde. <laughs> That's what yeah. I said. I was like, wasn't it just in retrograde like last week? Yeah. But you know, it's when you get older, it's like you know, it, it just time just kind of whatever. You know. Sure does. Yeah. Yeah. It does what it does. I'm over it. I'm ready for it to be over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spilling oh. tea says only twenty days left. We got this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of my one of my Islamic friends, he was like, he's like, brother, he goes, I'm dying over here. And I, I was like, what's wrong? What's what's what, what's happened? I've known this guy for like twenty five years. You know. He said, no, I'm I'm in Ramadan and I'm I'm so hungry. <laughs> he said that he was all of his coworkers. They went to eat at this place, a place burger place here. In, Austin called Hat Creek, and it's actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. I can't really go there anymore because of salt part. content. And my wife's like, no. Mm-hmm. But, you, you know, we, uh, he said they all went there, and so he had to sit there and watch everybody eat. Oh, that's <laughs> he rude. Truck and he just sat there in the <laughs> truck at the AC. He's like, good. And, he goes, and I said, well, it wasn't even cold. He goes, no, I just needed to get cold so I wouldn't be hungry. Yeah. <laughs> he was just like, I'm just trying to do whatever oh. I can, you know, and they can't even – drink water wow so it's yeah it's rough man so he's like dude and this was a few days ago and i think that it ends like on the 10th or something like that but he was like he said it's only like another week or something but it goes on for like 20 something you know days um like and i don't know off the top of my head you know but it's 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 a quite a while and Mm -hmm. and they can't eat now i remember one year when it fell in August and, you know, nighttime is only like 10 hours, you know, and it's daytime scorching hot for 14 hours. So imagine you you don't have very much time to eat and yep. then you got to try to go to bed. So, you know, uh, some of the guys that I worked with, they were Lebanese and some of them were Marianite Christian. Some of them were, were, were uh, Shiite Muslim. And the Shiites were having a hell of a time because they were saying, Hey man, it's, it's too hot. You know, I can't work out here in this. And, um, they had to go, they had to eat and then go to bed. Wow. So they had to go to bed right after eating. Oh. So just really, and they'd wake up feeling all, uh, you know, so yeah. it's, it's, it's rough, man, you know? And so, yeah, today has just been rough day. At least I don't have to deal with that. I can, you know, yeah. it's rough. <laughs> One less thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad it's the weekend. I had to spend my time talking to my lawyer today, which is just, I, I have five lawyers. Um, they're all, they all do different things. I have a real estate attorney, credit attorney, tax mm-hmm. attorney, um, anti-defamation attorney. And uh, yeah, and that, that was something that I had to deal with today, which just was not fun at all, but it was, and it's tedious, you know, you have to go through all these, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just like these people though, they're going to make you do it. I mean, you have to, you mm-hmm. know, they're just not going to be, they don't know how to act and just act cool. They got to be whatever. So where are, where we are, but it was it was a it was a hell of a day, but we we'll get through it. And um we got three hundred people in the chat here. Abe, you get it situated? Can you hear me, Abe? I don't know if you can hear me. That that is, still that is, muted. Oh, he's muted. Okay. Well, I saw that he put himself on mute earlier. I don't know if that's the case. 
Okay, maybe somebody could text him or something. Because I can't unmute his mic. Yeah. Adam says, paratrooper reporting for duty. I like that. <laughs> Adam, Adam Polson. Yeah, we got a really good group of people here at PRT. Very, very. Yep, you do. Um, you know, these people that, that are trying to like divide the community in the end, it's not going to work. They're going to divide themselves. You know? Right. Oh, yeah. Um, They're just little yapping dogs. I mean, that's right. That's how I see it. Just <laughs> they'll wear themselves out. That's yeah, it. hopefully that'll be the case. They're gonna make their big giant video that like like uh, what's his name up in Oklahoma was always gonna do. I mean, <laughs> shoot your shot, do what you got to do, man, and then let's right. get get it over with, get it all out, all your anger and your whatever, and then go on, you know. Right, right. Let, you know, Absolutely. do the juvenile little crybaby thing, and then let's move on, let's move forward. That's it. <laughs> Let me try this with with Abe. There you go, Abe. You got it. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear yes. you. Your, your, your uh, mic was muted earlier. Yeah, so. well, I, I, I got I got my phone on right now. Okay. So I'm gonna just use my phone. I don't know. What, this is I'm lagging pretty bad. Well, what what kind of internet connection do you got, brother? I got uh, uh I think it's uh AT and T. Yeah. Does it usually work pretty good, or is it just like messing up right now? And it's been messing up. Uh, just for a while now, the area. Wow. Okay, there we go. So what we need to do, Abe, we need to get you hooked up so you can get uh, get the equipment, get everything you need, so you can start doing your own channel, your YouTube. You need to get to YouTube because I follow you sometimes. I, I catch you on Facebook, and I saw that last uh, video you made, and I appreciate yeah. what you said. I really appreciate the kind words. It didn't go unnoticed, my friend, and. I appreciate the support, these people, and we're not going to talk about a whole lot. We're getting some people in the chat, but they came to you just like they came to Bettina, just like they came to everybody and tried to get people to turn on us and say all kinds of bad things about me and Anthony, Nelly, Maddie, whatever. Um, but, you know, you're doing evil. You're going around creating drama, creating evil. doesn't need to be like that. We can all just live in peace, but these people don't want peace. They want ridiculousness, but we're not going to give it to them. What we are well, going to do night is we're going to give them something. We're going to give them a show. There right? we go. There's Joe. What's up, my man? How you doing? I see you got the, the violet what color up, going on back there. What's going on with that with that color scheme? <laughs> I just switching it up, you know. Yeah, it, look, it looks groovy. Is that still a thing we can say? Groovy. <laughs> <laughs> you see it here loading in Las Vegas? Y'all ever seen Fair and Loathing in Las Vegas? I don't know if anybody in the audience has ever seen it. Mm -mm. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so there's a scene on there <laughs> where this guy's name is, like, R.L. Bumquist, right? And he's, like, some author. And he's, like, up there talking. Now, Johnny Depp's character, which is Hunter Thompson, and <laughs> oh, Dr. Gonzo, which is Benicio Del Toro, they go and they sit in to listen to this guy. And he's, like, the reaper, bud. Also known as the cockroach. <laughs> he goes like, it's like, because it resembles a cockroach. When he showed Toro's character, like, well, look like no damn cockroach. What are you talking about? <laughs> then Johnny Depp and him are both like, <laughs> they're watching this guy. The guy's just like, you know, blah, 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 the way he talks. Uh, it's a funny scene. If you haven't seen the movie, you got to check it out. Um, <laughs> but it's one of those movies where if you yeah, haven't done movie. those kind of things, you're not going to really know what the hell's going on. <laughs> Right. But it is a funny movie, <laughs> funny as hell. And like the way that they mumble and talk, you know, and it's like if you're if you've been there and done that, you will know that that's what happens when you get too far into, you know, what they were doing. But for me, it hasn't been a long, 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 long time. So but yeah, it is. It is. It's a great film. Dude. Go check it out. And even though Johnny Depp is, you know, one of the people that they consider to be a, a vampire. I'm not joking. These people said there's a rumor. Okay, I'm not saying he is, but there's a rumor about him. They say that he is. Um, I do like his films. I like him. <clears throat> and it, it was happy that, that Amber Heard, you know, lost. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 
I didn't keep up with it a lot. A couple of friends of mine and my wife were, were kind of paying attention to it. And I was just kind of watching, you know, here and there. But it was uh, it was crazy what was going on with that. <laughs> it was entertaining for sure. Yeah. So so what we were talking about in the other show on Blondes and Booze, we'll just jump right in. We were talking about shape-shifting in the Native American sense. And it's not. it doesn't just go with the Native Americans. Like I was talking about a story that was given to me from my friend Gallo. That means rooster in Spanish. He was down, locked up in a, in a, in a jail in Matamoros because he got in some trouble in a little town right below there. And uh, he was looking at some serious time, and he did do some time. Um, but what what goes gets you in trouble down in Mexico is not the same as what gets you in trouble up here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and what he did was he got caught with a firearm. Now, if you're certain people, you can pay your way out. Well, he wasn't those people. And he had some, some, uh, some stuff going on at that time in his life. So he was in a jail cell with a guy who was literally crawling up a wall and there was like, and he's told me this story, and it was me, and I think Starscream was there. Anybody from the conference probably remembers Starscream. He was the security mm -hmm. guy, and he was there along with uh, Squid, another one of my friends, and then my brother Diablo, uh, and Scorpion, and our old friend Willie. And we were all talking, and he was giving us this crazy story. He had just gotten out of jail, and he came back up to Texas, and um, he did like almost ten years, I think, there in a Mexican wow. prison, mm. and because he got in trouble. Uh, while he was in there, too, or he would have got out, but he didn't have the money to pay his way out because uh, his wife had basically took his money and ran off with another dude. So, <laughs> yeah, so that was rough. Oh, but uh, so, yeah, so he had a pretty hard, but he was he came up and he was telling us, because you're not going to believe this. When I was in one of the holding cells, you know, I was and I, I believe I've told this on the show before, but he witnessed what he thought was a possession that this person was like possessed. Well, what he found out was that the guy that he thought was was being possessed was actually a practitioner of brujeria. And this this black magic that he was doing was manifesting itself while he was in the jail. Because a lot of these people they will they will bug out, spin out when they go and get locked up. Um and it, and it's happened my cousin dated a Shoshone woman and we talked about this on Blondes and Booze. So if you were there earlier, you're just going to be a recap right now. But um, one of the things that uh, my cousin Trey told me, he was like, dude, I witnessed somebody shape-shifting. When he tells, I believe when he tells the story on the show, he's talking about someone else having seen it because he is very, not superstitious. I'm not, he's not a superstitious guy, but he does not believe in talking about it. Um, because that's something that he was taught by the girl that he was dating, who was a Shoshone woman. And it was at the Wind River Reservation where there was this something happened, and the DIF, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, picked this guy up, put him in jail, and he began to bug out and turn into something. Like he saw the legs of this being. And this is something he told me, Nellie and Anthony, when we interviewed him. He said that uh the, the legs of this being looked Painted, and the guy's upper body was twisting and turning. And at one point, the guy's body had turned all the way around to where he goes. The human spine doesn't do that. Like you know, he was completely like his upper body was looking one way, and his legs were looking another. So he was like backwards, you know. And he said that everybody started freaking out. And then he said the the natives did something which was kind of shocking to him. He's like, you know, he said that they just kind of all sat down and started holding hands and this began to pray. These are, these are guys that are all in jail. And the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs comes in and they wear these like suits or whatever. And they grab this dude and then they hear a helicopter and they come and they grab this guy and they take him um, up in a chopper. But he's like on some kind of like caged in gurney looking thing. And they were watching this happen. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. And, and according to him, it was an Arapaho, uh, individual that this happened to. Now, this is not something <clears throat> that is like completely like just out of the realm of like goofy fantasy, whatever. No, this is something that, like I said, my friend Gallo told us, he said, I watched this guy crawl up a wall. And then I saw the Mexican, uh, uh, police come in, uh, they, with their, with their riot gear, whatever they, they use, you know? 
And he said that they that they sprayed the guy and some of the inmates actually helped him and they got the guy under control. And he was somebody who was known for, for being a witch doctor that worked for a cartel. And they they literally practice shape shifting. Now we talked earlier on the show on Blondes and Booze. If you didn't hear it, check it out. I showed up late because I had to talk to I had to do some things with my attorney, but um we what we discussed, you know, what the Comanches believed in the Apache and what they were doing and how they were doing it. And one of the things that was very disgusting to them, and one of the reasons why they wanted to eradicate certain tribes of the Apaches, um, in particular the Karankawas and the Tonkawas, because they used human body parts and human blood in their um, rituals to achieve this shape shifting. And supposedly, there was a monk known as Espinosa. And now Espinosa was in charge of the Yatki mission down in the, the southern border um, of Mexico and Texas, which at that time was no border. It was just a river. But it was kind of the, 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 the crossover zone. And the area was called the Rio Grande uh, zone, basically. And he was in control of that. And it was at a place uh, near Eagle Pass. And Abe, you're from Texas, so are you, Joe and Monica. You're all you probably are familiar with Eagle Pass. That's um, the region I'm from. I was uh, from from the Rio Grande Valley, right by the border. So yeah, I know the area. You look like you could be Yaki Yaki Indian, for real, Abe. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's native in my family. I just don't know what what native, you know. But if you look like in my great great grandmother, she looks native and. Uh, you know, to believe in the old ways. Uh, um, she was a medicine woman and the, the cures, you know, spiritually. Uh, but yeah, it's just how I was, my upbringing's war, and they're, they're, they talk about all that, you know, uh, brujos, brujas, uh, brujeria. Now they got the Santari, uh, Santanista, Santa Muerte, where they worship uh, some some lady with a death face, you know. That's what the cartels worship. Santa they praise her. They pra they have Santa Muerte, they praise her for, to protect them, you know. But it's death, you know. Uh, I grew up all, all around that, and it does exist. Uh, you got, you know, the Black Witches, which was, there was a lot of uh, witch battles. You got the Good Witches and the, and the Bad Witches, and just a constant spiritual battle of where I grew up. When I was a kid, that I that I witnessed, and between I was born sixty nine, so between sixty nine to to eighty, I seen a lot of spiritual battles. Uh, the things that happened down there in the valley was the sighting of the big bird that was attacking the people. That happened in the seventies. Uh, the 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 UFO and uh, the the cattle was being found with no blood. The uh, cows were being found on top, on top of poles. So there was a lot of activity happening which a lot of things were surfacing up at that time frame you know uh the, the thing with this this giant bird I, 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 what i witnessed was not a a bird it was a demonic creature uh it was uh i witnessed it uh out in the ranch uh towards san manuel and it was uh whether you know you're talking about shape shifter but uh it was all black and the same skin of the of the wings was the body, and he had red eyes and he had white teeth, um, with sharp teeth and sharp claws, and that had tried to attack us. You know, it was attacking a lot of people down in the Rio Grande Valley around the time frame. But that exists. You know, I believe what uh, Brother Judge is saying with the shapeshifters. I witnessed that the 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 brujas they the, the shapeshift to look like a, a a we call them lechuzas. And that's a form of manifestation to take, which is an owl. And they're they're pretty big. The black witches they turn into black big owls. I'm I'm talking about they're massive. I would say when they're on the trees, they're good a good six to seven foot, probably eight foot tall. But they're on the trees, and they have the ability to to say something to you, talk to you. Uh, uh, they uh, they laugh at you because. There's not only one, there's several, uh, and I witnessed this. So the only thing we can do is is go into prayer, but 
I believe in the in the the that does exist. Uh, this shape shifting. Uh, you know, when you talk about possessions, when people people get possessed, that's a that's kind of like a form of being controlled by something else. So your body acts a certain way. You move your movements or awkwardly. So sometimes people allow this demonic entities into them. So they get attacked and they're acting out of the ordinary in which they have mm -hmm. superhuman strength. Uh, they're doing things awkwardly. And I, I witnessed myself, one of my uncles got spiritually attacked where he was literally climbing a wall. Like brother Josh Turner is saying, he was climbing a wall, acting like a lizard. Then he, he jumped off the wall and jumped on the bed and he started acting like a rooster. You know, he's talking about a guy. So he's not himself. It's kind of like his, his mind is out there. And we go into prayer. We're, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying for him. And uh, after a while, uh, praying, I'm talking about it's a lot of us, my, my brothers and sisters, my mother, my father, and his family, which was a lot. We were all going into prayer. And finally, whatever was within them left his body and it went out the window. It was like a disembodied spirit form or demonic form. It went like in a, in a smoke form and it blew out the screen uh, when he left his body. When that happened, he became normal. But there is a lot of uh, that that happens down there in the Rio Grande Valley and, you know, within the native culture, you know, skinwalkers, shapeshifters. Uh, I've had encounters uh, with this the skinwalker shapeshifters in uh, in Elms Grove. Uh, they're they're very uh, how should I say persistent, persuasive, persistent. They when they know what you're about spiritually and it goes against what they what they practice, they come after you. And I've witnessed them there in Elms Grove. Uh, when it's the woman, uh, I call her the dear woman, where she manifests. I've seen uh, a big form go on beside my friend's mobile home. And me and my nephew go and find out what's going on because we thought somebody was breaking in. Then this woman comes out and her shirt is like deer print. And she's looking at us and she said that we could give her a ride. And, I, and I, which it's like two in the morning. I said, I don't know you, ma'am. Then she asked my nephew and I said, I don't know you, man. So she starts walking. But as she was walking up the street, you could see her right leg just flapping. It's moving real fast. And when we're looking, we're seeing the leg of a deer, you know, the literally the leg of a deer flapping where she didn't have the time to fully manifest into the, the woman form. So half her body is, is woman and half of the other body is still the deer form. So we're following her, but she left us behind real fast because she was um, moving with some pretty, uh, uh, with a lot of speed. We were running and we couldn't catch up to her, but uh, she couldn't manifest to her full form. But we, normally, if you look at the feet, I mean, sometimes, uh, like they say that their woman, she's very beautiful. She, she's trying to distract you just to look here and she, with a beautiful smile. And But if you look at the feet, that's where you're gonna see that it's beastly. So, you know, uh, but it happened there in Elms Grove, you know, and and then the other one was a, a shapeshifter that was wearing the fur uh, or the hide of a coyote on his head. What happened there was it was a, a, a when I, a, my dog was barking, I went outside my home and there was a, a red fox looking at me and I was looking at the red fox and uh, the red fox after a while turned around, started walking away. So I started following the fox as I went around the mobile home, which was my neighbor's Miss Ken's mobile home. It wasn't a fox anymore. It was an old man, and he was naked. Naked because you, you couldn't see. He had no pants on. He was naked. But he had the, the hide on his on his head, on his back, and he, and he walked like if he was a hunchback. Walk, uh, like a hunchback would walk. He was barefooted and it was cold. It was like, uh, I think at that time it was like 20 something degrees outside. So in my mind, I'm like, what is this man doing out here butt naked, you know? So I'm following him just trying to see where he's gonna go if he lives in the neighborhood, right? I follow him, he goes out of the mobile home park and I follow him down the street, I follow him uh, around this, the embark, there's a, uh, a fence. He was going towards the airport, 
know, there's nothing but trees in that area. He went uh, along the, the fence line and he went behind a bush. So I'm looking, then I see the St. Bernard run from behind the bush to another bush and I'm looking for the old man and looking for that St. Bernard. And then I see a bird fly away. So I walk along the fence just to see if the old man's there. The old man is not there. I look to the other bush, the, the St. Bernard is not there. And I believe he shapeshifted from the old man to the St. Bernard and to the bird. That, I witnessed that in Elm Scroll. Mm -hmm. But yes, there, there, there's a lot of, uh, that's the witchcraft and orcromancy, you know. Mm -hmm. they, some of the, the only way to gain those capabilities is to sell their soul. And some of the, the natives that live here in Central Texas, they're kind of ballistic. Uh, the ones that he just mentioned, the uh, uh, Kawanka and Karakawas. Yeah. They're, and they're, they used to, they, was supposedly they they actually use blood and and bone and, and things in there, supposedly. Now, this is. I, no, I yeah, there was, the, there's a story uh, where, because the Kawankans used to work with the Cav and the, when they were in horse regiments. And they were they would hunt other natives, Cherokee, Comanche. They were they were like the scouts for the scouts of yeah. the US Cav. Uh, there's a story where uh, one of the soldiers that had captured, uh, I believe he was a Comanche or Cherokee, and he couldn't find uh, uh, the scouts, which was the Kawankans or the the Tawank, the, the live in Central Texas. So he went to go look for them, and what he found, he found them. They were eating. Cannibal, cannibalistically eating them raw, yeah. you know. So, uh, to my understanding, mm -hmm. you know, to, to my understanding, that's why there's a lot of acti activity around here because this, 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 the in, these natives that were cannibalistic, they didn't believe in, uh, like, in greens. They were just about uh, meat. So. How would they would kill people? You know, shove them off cliffs or or buffalo, or whatever. Shove them off cliffs, and but that's what they were kind of ballistic, and I believe that's why there's a lot of activity here in Central Texas, where we I'm seeing all these skinwalkers and shapeshifters. It's not I'm not the only one. Uh, there was a pizza driver that was going to uh, deliver a Belton Lake, and he said that he was is going to go deliver and. That a shape uh, shapeshifter passed right in front of him, stood in front of his car, and he looked at him, and he went across the street into the woods. He literally seen him. After that, he stopped delivering pizza. You hear it all the time. I always get messages from people where they said that they were looking into in, in uh, inside their home, or they're banging on the doors. Uh, that's the activity that's in Central Texas, and you know, it's it's pretty 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 heavy. Uh, like Salado, they found the oldest uh, site of of natives. So there's a lot of activity like like that, shape shifting, skinwalkers. I've witnessed them, and other people have witnessed them. It just uh, they exist, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, what, what you were talking about, it, it, you know, with this uh, the shape shifting. Somebody just said in the Dominican Republic, that's Brother Heck. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said earlier about the deer woman. Well, that's a legend that a lot of people have, have talked about. We talked about that on Blondes and Booze earlier. Um, everything you were saying is correct. Like the Tonkawa scouts were, were, were known to be cannibalistic. And that was one of the reasons why the Comanches were literally waging a war of genocide against them. The Comanches were my were my. Oh, they did. People, but. I mean, I'm not trying to make excuses for my ancestors, but we just didn't like cannibals, all right? I'm just saying. Yeah, they came after them. They, the, 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 <laughs> the story is that they all gathered up because they killed a lot of the family members. So the Comanche, the Cherokee, and other natives came into Texas. Iowa. Yeah. They came into Texas and were annihilated, were destroying them. They were killing them, killing everybody that the government had to get in. So they, they, the government got in involved in it and they moved them to oklahoma mm -hmm. right they moved to oklahoma so they started doing the same thing in oklahoma they start they, they would call them dirty indians they, they 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 started cannibalizing people in oklahoma 
So they started cleaning oil, so they moved them back to Texas. When they moved it back to Texas, they came again to try to kill them all. They were trying to eliminate them because a lot of people were pissed off because they killed the family members. So the governors from here didn't want them here, so they moved them to Arizona area, New Mexico area, you know, into the into that area. That's where their their last the last remainder of them went that way. So when when I hear all this activity that happens, like in New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, I think about them, you know, because well, yeah, because Deborah D says that Caroncoa lived along the Gulf Coast and were described as giants by some, and they practiced cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Now, let me explain something: the Tonkawas and the Caroncoas were actually relatives. That's why they, yeah, you know, the last name, whatever. They were also related to the Kiowa. But the legend is that they were like all family at one point. The Kiowa moved up north and lived just east of the Trinity River. They were no, they were located like east of Dallas and in East Texas that way. Um, they were very, very, very aggressive. And they were considered to be the Okay, is there anybody there? Play well with others. And they absolutely despise. Yeah, we're here. It's the brother end of that Josh. game. It, it, for some hey, brother Josh. Uh, it looked like you were shape shifting over there. Your oh. face moved real crazy. Wow. Well, that's great. <laughs> Give me something to look at and be like, look, I told you he was an evil yeah. reptilian. <laughs> um, who knows what they'll come up with next? You know. Um, yeah. But you, you know, when you look at like these these natives and, and, and where they lived and you'd look at a map of Texas, right? And you could see where they were and, and, and what their range was. The Kiowa were the only ones that really allied with the Comanches. Now, the Comanches were friendly with the Lakota and the Cheyenne um, in the way that they would trade with them. They would trade and they, and they weren't on each other's territory, so they had no fight with them. So Lakota is what a lot of people refer to as the Sioux. Now, I'm going to say something about that really quickly here. They don't like being called that. They're called Lakota. The reason that they were called Sioux, it was not like the, the myth is that it was a derogatory term that was given to them, which means poop by another tribe. No, it was because of their penchant for dipping their arrows in animal dung. So that when they shot someone, it was quite effective. When they shot someone, it would literally give them sepsis. And if that, that arrow, even if it was just a flesh wound, you would die from it. Now, you have to wonder why were they so brutal and violent and whatever. One of their big enemies, the Pawnee, were some of the most savage uh, of, of all the natives in the way that they, you know, fought and did things. And so the, the, that was just one of, of many native tribes that they were surrounded by. So the Lakota had kind of turned into a pretty uh, tough war machine because they were, they were facing some pretty brutal enemies. The Pawnee were known to be. Um, they, they were not necessarily cannibals, but one of the things they liked to do was cut people's liver out and take a bite. Um, and it was just to show you, like, look, this is what we do. You know, we're so they weren't to be messed with. I mean, you know, so Lakota were like, hey, you know, we're, we're dealing with some pretty uh, savage characters. We're going to do whatever we can to defend ourselves. And they did. Uh, I'm not judging anybody for what they did to do whatever. But uh, the Comanche were known to be serious, serious uh, uh like violent, aggressive, probably some of the worst. I mean, when it comes to warfare, like the, the, they just did not care. And they, they, you know, they took you as a slave to have you in a breed, maybe whatever. But for the most part, they just wiped everybody out. If you were not a Comanche, you were not a Nermina, you were basically an enemy. You were an Apache. And an Apache could literally be a white, black, Asian. It did not matter. The, in Anson, Texas, they descended on black and, and Chinese railroad road workers. They were building a railroad, I believe it was for the Union Pacific, but they killed them all. And they knew that the Comanches did it because <clears throat> they found the Chinese quay, uh, the hair, you know, they had the quay, which is a Mongolian adaptation. Um, when the Han Dynasty was, was in, in their waning years, which would have been like uh, the, the late 200s or whatever they were of A.D., the Mongolians were on the rise and the Mongolians began to make inroads into China and they took part of China, which even today now is called Inner Mongolia, but it's part of China, kind of weird. But anyway, they used the type of hairstyle that was a sign of submission to the Khan. 
which was anywhere from Genghis to Kubla, it doesn't matter. Um, and Genghis's real name was T Tumujin, and, but he was from a, a tribe called the Merkits. And they were just an obscure tribe and they took over. And, and so the Chinese had this quay. Well, the Comanches liked to scalp. And one of the things that they liked was the Chinese quay. They liked to take it. And they liked to take African-American hair because they thought it was like buffalo hair, buffalo hide, whatever. I'm not making this up. This is a true story. And they also yeah. liked to scalp red-haired yeah. people. That's, That's the truth, yeah. Well, Joe Breezy, you yeah. and Abe, we live in Central Texas. This yeah. is right there in Cedar Creek where you were. There was a Comanche encampments right there. Um, I have friends that have found arrowheads in those creek beds. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, up there yeah. where you are. Babe, yeah, the, the commands. There's arrowheads, and sometimes if you're there in the sun is setting, you, they'll talk to you. The spirits of the natives, they'll cough or they'll say something to you. That's they'll tell what you, happens. They'll, 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 they'll say like, for example, because a, a lot of those natives, they live along the creeks. They were woodlanders. They live. They didn't have a house. They live within the woods. So you 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 hear them say like, get out, <laughs> or you know, they'll they'll you hear footsteps running towards you. Then and there's a, you're like, oh, that's my cue to leave. So you you get you get out of there. You know, it's kind of like to them, they steal the territory because that, that was where they lived. Uh, yeah. When you when you pretty, go back and you look at the history of these of these uh, tribes, you see that there is a common thread that runs through them all, and that is one thing that you will always find. I don't care what anybody says, there was always a shapeshifter element to them. Yeah. Now, most of that was practiced by the medicine man, but the shaman. the shaman, yeah, and it was considered to be a good thing, good medicine. But at one point, at some point during the incursions from the the Spanish and the Mexicans, uh, in particular with the, with the Mexicans, when they began to push up into Texas, um, and and they took over Texas from the Spaniards after they gained independence, there was a lot of warring that went on between the Comanches and the Mexicans. The, um, the Comanches took them as captives quite a bit. And at one point when the, when the Anglos arrived, there were only about 5,000 Mexican citizens that lived in all of Texas. There is one reason for that and one reason only, the Comanches because the Comanches did not play well with others. And so Santa Ana had a hard time trying to get the Mexican citizens to live up here. And so at one point, his predecessor and him himself, and of course, the Emperor Maximilian uh, 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 Bonaparte, he decided when he, when he, France had control, it was something that they started when they had control of Mexico, they sent Mexican people to live up here in Texas, force them to. Now, one way that you won the lottery to live around the Comanches was to get in trouble. Another way was to not pay your taxes. So they were like, oh, okay, so we're going to make you move to the colonies that we're trying to establish, and good luck because everyone around you is going to try and kill you. <laughs> um, and so that was yeah. what they did, and so they <laughs> sent them up here to Texas. So when the Anglos came... There were literally less than 5,000 Mexicans in the entire state of Texas. Uh, there was a reason for that, because the Comanches were so damn mean. And the, But the Comanches, much like the Lakota, as people know them as the Sioux, although, like I said, that's not really what they are, the reason that, that, that they were so damn mean is because they were surrounded by, like, awful <laughs> enemies, some of which are lost yeah. to the to the sands of time because they were genocided by the Comanches and the Kiowa. And then some of them just moved on to New Mexico, like the Mescalera, and, and some of the other ones, they just got the hell out of Dodge because they were like, dude, the Comanches are just too damn mean. We can't deal with them. Um, and you never know where they're going to show up, and Comancheria is a huge place. Now, the Comanches are one of the few, few tribes, and i got to stress this, they did not have a shapeshifter uh, element. They do not have any records of them shape-shifting or doing any of that. But they did cite that as one of the reasons, and they told one of these monks who lived and died in the devil's backbone that that was one of the reasons why they hated the Apache, in particular the Apache natives, because they would shape-shift and they would eat people. And a blood feud had started between them and the other Apaches in the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, when the when the Comanches had learned to to master the horse, 
they became known as the Lords of the Plains. There's even a book about it called the Lords of the Plains. And literally, they held sway for about 400 years over all the other natives, over the Spaniards, over the Mexicans, over everybody, over the Anglos. Um, there's a funny scene in a movie uh, in Lonesome Dove called, I think it's Comanche Moon, where the Union had just won the war and some douchebag in a blue uniform goes up and says, we need to do something about the Comanches. They've gotten out of hand. And it's uh, uh, Augustus is sitting there and he's, he's blacksmithing. And he's like, he goes, you know, Colonel, the Comanches have been out of hand for a long time. And we're, you know, like now you're going to come up, we're going to deal with the Comanches, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like, well, good luck with that. And then, well, we need you to do it too. He's like, we've been doing it. We're called Texas Rangers. And you're not going to whip them. Maybe you can starve them to death, but you're not going to beat them in the open field. So good luck. And so, you know, it's basically like, and it's in the book. It's, 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 uh, you know, everybody knows the book, Lonesome Dove. I forgot the, the author, McMurtry. Another good author, if you want to read about this kind of stuff, kind of off topic, on topic, Elmer Kelton, who writes a lot of books, and I love those. I, I read a little bit of fiction. It's old West fiction. Elmer Kelton, he talks a lot about the Comanches and the Apaches and their interaction with the, with the Spanish, the, the, the Mexicans, the French, and the Anglos and how it all went down. And it's sort of a historical fiction. Check it out if you're inter interested in that kind of thing. Now, you have these accounts of, of these Comanche warriors committing genocide against the Tonkawa and the Karankawa. And when they're asked why, uh, them and the Kiowa were very, very just straightforward. Like, they eat us. That's why. Yeah. Don't want them around. And one of the things that they would do was shapeshift. They would use human flesh, blood in particular. Uh, there was a Kickapoo story that I had, because I have a friend who's a Kickapoo, and he actually lives down there near Pedras Negras. And he would he told me I used to work with this guy. He said his grandmother told him that <clears throat> the Lapan Apache and the Tonka Apache were very bad and very hard to deal with because they tried to kill all of the Kickapoo and they were almost destroyed. And they actually have a legend, a story that their great spirit actually gave them the Comanches to stop them from murdering all the other tribes. So there had to be one boss. And that, to them, was the Comanche. So the Comanche had kind of an uneasy truce with the Kickapoo. They weren't necessarily friends, but they didn't really mess with them because the Kickapoo weren't really a threat. The Kickapoo were staying out of their way. They, for the most part, were living right there on the border of the Rio Grande in that particular region. And they kind of scooted all the way across the river, following the river up to the east. And so you had areas of Comancheria where if you went, you were almost guaranteed to be attacked. You were not to stay there and not be in those regions. Now, the Apache, as they call them, were, were regular offenders of this. And eventually the Spaniards joined forces with the Comanches to eradicate, annihilate some of the uh, nastier elements of what would be considered the Apache. Um, and those particular Apache tribes, like I said, they're lost to time. We don't even know what they're called. Some of them were called the cactus eaters and different names that the Apaches, other Apaches and the Comanches gave them, um, you know. Um, but they had some weird uh, rituals and things that were recorded by some of these Spanish and French, uh, you know, the, the, the people that in, the incursions they made into this area. And it's le left behind is like, hey, this is, you know, what these people said about them. Um, in particular, there's a French uh, man, a Frenchman who came and I think we lost Breezy there for a minute. But uh, he came into Texas as a trapper and a trader, and he ended up going back into Louisiana and stayed because, believe it or not, the people that settled uh, Louisiana actually came from Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Now, people don't realize that, but they fought a war with their, which was at one time their Scottish allies. Now people don't understand what that is. They were Jacobites and they were trying to uh, I don't know what that was. That was me. Sorry. That's a okay. people thinking they're cool driving by my house. <laughs> but Nova Scotia was where they came from. And so they ended up not playing well together. So the Scots with the help of the British, because Canada was at one time a British protectorate, part of the Commonwealth, um, they drove them out, and they ended up just traveling all the way down to uh, Louisiana, where they had taken over certain places. There, were, the port of New Orleans was originally a Spanish port. The, the the French took it over, and they basically told their their cousins, 
from the North, hey, come here and you could set up shop here. Now, there was one such guy that went to the settlement of, uh, of New Orleans and he brought with him fantastical stories. And I've read this in a book and it was, I'm not going to get into a big long thing, but he talked about how some of these tribes in Texas could change themselves into animals like crows and bears. And he said it was amazing what he saw. And he wrote about it, and it's an old book, um, but it was like this guy's journey uh, into Texas, and he was a French trapper originally. And the French tended to have a very uh, uh, amicable relationship with the natives. The natives really didn't have a problem with the French. The French didn't really get in their way, and they tended to kind of be like, you know, nice to the natives. And if they took something, they gave something, which was smart on their part. And a lot of them were very uh, rural people anyway. So they could live off the land and they didn't leave a big footprint. So they didn't have a lot of problems with them. The Germans were the same way. They tended to not have a lot of problems with the natives. And in fact, uh, the, the, the settlement of Fredericksburg, Schulenburg, and New Braunfels, which was where we were going to have the conference until these idiots messed it up. But um, the, so New Braunfels, those were cities that, believe it or not, never got attacked by the Comanche, nor did they get attacked by the local uh, tribes. Um, they tended to be, get along very well with them, and they allowed them to take some of their cattle kind of as a tribute to saying, hey, take this or whatever. We'll share with you. We don't have to fight. Now, the Anglos were different. The Anglos came from the east, and they were like, no, we have an unsavory look about you. That's why I brought my gun, you know, um, and that's they just were not going to get along. And the, the <laughs> Tejanos, as they, were, they became known by the Comanches, they just were not going to play well with them. And so they they tended to be the British um, British speaking or people whatever you know are descended people. One of the places is right here. It's called Austin Colony. Now Austin Colony, I work there. There's, there's a swimming pool we do every every summer there, and I've had to actually work there. But there's a historical marker. Uh, there's two or three of them, and then there's an old cemetery. And Breezy, you live in this area, you probably know about that. And they're all right there, and you can go and check it out. And it's actually uh, Roger Hornsby, one of the great baseball players from years ago, 20s and 30s, um, and it's it's called Hornsby Bend. But there was a site of a battle that took place there between Comanches and cavalry soldiers in, the 18, in 1881, and the Comanches destroyed them because in the open field, you couldn't beat them. The only success that anyone ever had was a Spanish uh, colonel who actually fought them in the open field, and he used the Spanish lancers to defeat them, and they were defeated – uh, about 20 miles uh, west uh, or east of uh, of El Paso, and they were driven out of that region, and they never had a problem with them again. But that, as far as we know, is the only real, um, you know, ass kicking they got from anybody. Um, other than there was a when they raided Victoria, they were ambushed on their way back, and they were ambushed in a town called Luling, right outside of Lockhart. And the Texas Rangers spearheaded that with the help of their Native allies, and they did give the, the Comanches a black eye, but it didn't last long because two weeks later they burned Austin down. So <laughs> the Comanches were like, okay, you did this, now we're going to do that. But a lot of their reasoning, and they just kept saying this like it was a mantra, was that the people need to have a place to live. And the, the, the Anglos didn't understand this. They were like, why do you need to have 400 square acres or whatever? And they said, because the people we live around will eat us. They continued with this, and they also said that there were giants. Now, there is a story, and I told this on another show. I can't even remember the name of the guy now, but it was he was a, uh, a cavalryman, and he got killed in a battle supposedly with what we would call stone giants or the Genosqua. And this happened, as Brother Abe was talking about, up in Oklahoma near what was a, a reservation. These Tonko and Karanko were taken, stole to the to the Oklahoma was just becoming a state. It wasn't even it was a territory before that. It was a little nothing, whatever. Um, and it should still be that way. I'm just I'm kidding, folks. I'm joking. I don't like Oklahoma, but anyway, <laughs> Longhorn fan. But anyway, so so they send them up to to Oklahoma, and they have a problem. There are these monsters or whatever you want to call them. And this is supposedly was in 1876. And I can't tell you the exact date. That's what supposedly. And it was on a show I did with this other guy. And uh, but anyway, we talk about that. 
And what happened was, just to make a long story short, the, the United States Cavalry came in and had to fight against these natives. They were out of control, and they had these what you would consider monsters. There were like three or four of them that were like giants. And they had tree sap all over their body with giant rocks stuck to them. And their guns were not penetrating. They were not hurting these monsters, and they seemed to be friendly with these individuals. Now, some people say that the Tonko or the Karankawa on the coast could actually transform into these creatures, mm -hmm. or that they were their descendants. You know, they were the ancestors, like a sub nature that they worshipped, a totem that followed them, and that they could actually make them appear like they by doing their blood ceremonies and with the ingestion of human flesh and blood these beings would come to them as their ancestors and if you look at the Karankawa a lot of there were descriptions that were given by some of the U.S. cavalrymen and some of the Confederate cavalry that noticed it when they used them as scouts in the war they noticed that they had a protruding jaw and a very wide forehead Looking kind of throwbackish. Think of like the movie Bone Tomahawk. If you haven't seen it, that's kind of what the Karankawas were said to look like. And they were like some sort of throwback from an, what I would believe like the antediluvian period. You know, something that was there um, that's not natural, not normal. And they like to eat people. It was kind of gross. And so the Comanches insisted these are the people we're trying to eradicate. And you're stopping us. Now. Some of the Spaniards wrote, because the monks loved to write, because that's all they did, and they would say the, the Comanches have a blood feud with these people because basically, let's put it this way, the Comanches, before they learned how to master the horse, got their asses kicked by these people way back, so they have this blood feud that's been going on for centuries, not decades, but centuries, and so it is a war of genocide being waged by the Comanches, but... I believe a lot of that, and not being a homer because I'm part Comanche, but I believe part of that is really just them propagandizing a reason to, to send more troops, to bring them in, to kill and stop the incursions of the Comanches because they were so damn mean, but not really grasping or understanding what the Nermina, the Comanche, were seeing. And you can only imagine, now for a minute, just imagine if you were a Comanche warrior. Go back to the year 1790. OK, the Anglos aren't here. There's some Spaniards running around and there's some Mexicans, but not many. And really what you're dealing with are cannibal tribes. Yep. And you have an advantage because you're a master of the horse. But if you weren't, you would still be getting preyed upon and eaten by these people. Because that's what was happening in the 14 and 1500s before the Spanish brought their horses here. Once the horses came... <clears throat> The Comanches were smart. They were considered to be a highly intelligent race, and they watched the, the Spaniards, and they watched how they bred the horses and how they handled them, and they paid attention to animal husbandry, and they learned from the Spaniards, from watching them from a distance, how to utilize the horse as a weapon. And they learned how the Spanish lancers were so successful at skewing and defeating their enemies on horseback, which was something that the Spaniards had learned from their old enemy, the Arabs, the Moors, the Berber, the Islamic incursion into the Iberian Peninsula that went on for 800 years and it was perpetual warfare nonstop. The southern Spaniards were constantly at war. They were inundated with the, their protection of their religion and they were being imposed upon by Islam. So what did they do? What did they do? When they finally defeated Islam and drove it out and, and put everything back together, the people in the north said, we don't really have anything for you. You know, you're going to have to go do something. One of those people was Cortez, and his dad had fought for years and tried to do whatever, and he said, dude, we don't have anything. We live in a barren land. If you want to be the aristocracy, you're not going to do it here. Go somewhere else. So he did. He took a, a, a job basically working for the governor of Cuba. The governor of Cuba wouldn't commission him to go and do anything but explore. He wouldn't give him nothing but a handful of men. He got popular enough to where he managed to take 
an entire legion of, of soldiers and stole some ships. He was basically an outcast pirate is what he did. Then he got to the coast. He met the Tabascans, quickly realized that they weren't going to be friendly, killed them. This is down in Mexico. Burned the ships so that nobody could leave and run back and tattle on him to the, to the governor of where he went. And then said, well, it's do or die. And then they went in and they conquered the Aztecs and the rest is history. And then went all up into Texas. Then he became a hero because he sent tons and tons of gold back to the king of, of Spain, the emperor, actually. And he wasn't a king. He was an emperor. The emperor has many kings under him. So then the emperor says, hey, 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 leave him alone. I like this guy. He's paying me. And he just kicked a bunch of people's asses. So the governor of Cuba was actually deposed, taken out, and killed. Because guess what? Cuba's yours now, now because you just conquered Mexico. You can just have Cuba as a, you know, just we're going to throw it in there for you. You're doing great. Oh, You're sending gold. So the Spaniards needed to find more gold. Well, they had already, Pizarro had already taken the, the, uh, the Andes, the Incans, and, you know, this guy, Cortez, had already taken the, uh, the Aztecs. And so they looted it left and right. Nothing left. Well, let's go up into Texas. Then they figured out that Texas didn't have anything but but death, rattlesnakes, and Comanches. Not something that you're going to want to be around. But they had no choice because Spain needed money. Spain was waging war across Europe and across just about everywhere. And so they needed war chests. So the Spaniards just kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. And eventually that is how the Comanches came to be the Comanches. They were a nomadic tribe that had kind of settled down in Texas and they were surrounded by cannibalistic enemies and they used the horse to, to their advantage and to eventually usurp and take over and defeat not only their, the Spanish overlords, but the Mexican overlords and then all of the, the other natives. So they pretty much conquered everybody around them and even the Anglos couldn't do it. What ultimately stopped the Comanches was that they were starved. How? They killed off the buffalo. Mm -hmm. And that is how they did it. Because if they hadn't starved them, the Comanches, I promise you, would still be today running around doing whatever it is that they were doing because nobody was going to stop them. And, but they always had that, that fallback that, hey, this all started because these people were cannibals. Their ancestors were cannibals and they were giants and they preyed upon us. And in the night... They would take our children and they would eat them in front of us in the form of a jaguar. Or they would snatch our children up as in the form of giant birds. And the stories that they told, in particular the Kiowa had legends. And it's just why that they built their totems for protection. Because they asked these animal spirits, they said, please stop these evil people. Don't allow them to use your form, please. So the Kiowa would dance around these totems made of ravens and wolves and jaguars or cougars, whatever, cats. And they would ask these spirits of these animals because to them, every animal has one particular totem spirit that has power over the others. That's how the legend of the bear king actually works. It's, it's somebody who's a shapeshifter, but he has the power over all the other bears. That's why he's called the bear king. And the natives came up with that term. Right. So what ended up happening? The Kiowa, they asked their totem animals, can you please stop these villains, these bad guys from coming in and the form and taking your form? So supposedly it worked. The, the wolf, the raven and the jaguar all agreed, according to Kiowa legend, that they will not allow their enemies to take that form. So if they are killed, it is not by a human that is using that manipulation. It is because the animal is hungry and needs sustenance, right? So they told the Comanches this. And, of course, the Comanches are like, this is bull crap. <laughs> you know, we don't believe this. That's fine that you believe that. That's fine. We're cool with you, and we get it. You have the same enemies as us, but these are just people doing this bull crap, and we're going to kill them because, like I said before, the Comanches didn't have any of that magic stuff. They didn't care about that, and they didn't have medicine people. All they had them for was to heal, and they were women. They didn't use men for that. So here we have most tribes do have medicine men, some of them that practice the good medicine and some of them that practice the bad medicine. 
Now, if you look at the Navajo, everybody knows the legends of the Navajo. The great late uh, J.C. Johnson, who I looked at, is a very, very good source for that. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, David Weatherly, looked at him as a very good source, and I trust David's judgment on this. Um, he watched them. He lived with them. And he watched even some of the younger people do these shape-shifting rituals and become different animals like coyotes and foxes and wolves and mm -hmm. deer. So whenever you listen to these people talk about it, it's very nonchalant. It's very nonchalant. It's like, hey, these people, they actually can do these things. These are This is a real thing. And now so many people nowadays will say, you know, I don't, I don't believe that this can happen. How is it possible that somebody could shapeshift? And they'll even quote a ridiculous science principle that, oh, it would take so much energy to become that, to change into that or whatever, blah, 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 blah. No, dude, it doesn't. It doesn't take a lot to do that because – Energy is infinite and it is in abundance. Only us as humans have been led to believe that energy is not all around us and in the air and in every single thing that we do, everywhere we look, talk, breathe, eat, sleep, whatever. Thank you for that donation, Truth Walker. I like your name, too. Great show tonight. I'll be joining the Patreon soon. Thank you. We haven't had a Patreon member in about a month. But, uh, you know, here's the thing. When you look at these stories and these legends, I don't believe that these are just stories and legends for children. In fact, they're not for children at all because the skinwalker, whether it's a Navajo shapeshifter or it's the Shoshone or the Arapaho or the Iowa or whoever, it doesn't matter. It's always the same. They did it in, in times of warfare. They did it to be scouts, to do this, to do that. But somewhere down the line, it became corrupted. And every tribe, with the exception of a few, with the exception of just a few, had these shapeshifter legends and those shapeshifters now the ones that we see now have no real purpose the only purpose they would have now is to do what bad so that's why they're out there running around doing what they do that's my opinion i don't think that there's really an, a good reason for it and i've talked to many natives who have talked to me and told me stories of these things and if you get to know them everybody's like they don't like to talk about it Okay, yeah, if they don't like you, I mean, that's pretty much it. I'm not trying to be ugly or mean to people, but I've yes. heard people go, up to me go, well, they won't talk about it. And I go up and they're like, yeah, I'll tell you about it. What's up? You know, and I was like, well, I don't know what they did with you because maybe they don't like you or they don't trust you or they think that you're bad medicine. Because a lot of people, in particular in the Bigfoot community, and this isn't a swipe at any one particular person, um, but what they'll do is they'll pick and choose the part that they like the natives talking about. And then when it comes to, well, Bigfoot's a spirit. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, there's a bunch of ignorant savages. I'm done with that. Ha, ha, ha. Because it doesn't fit the narrative. It says the, the, the Bigfoots are demonic. Yeah. And so as soon as a native tells you, hey, and actually I was just messaging with one earlier. And when they tell you they're not good, maybe you should stay away from them. Why don't you stop giving them donuts and tobacco and your time? People are not going to do that. They're going to be like, well, I'm a, I'm a smart man, and I know this, and I know that. We also know that the people who do those things will be the first ones to be like, I love Native American people. I just don't like it when they talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's my soapbox. I'm going to move on from that. So, Joe, you've been quiet. Joe and, and Monica, Krista, y'all want to say something? Me and yeah. Abe have been hogging up all the time. I've been listening, been listening and learning. Yeah, I'm just I'm just jamming to the groove, man. I mean, you know me. I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it's it, you, everything you're saying was on point. You know, like mm -hmm. no doubt. Yeah. It's what do you stuff. think? Yeah, it's nice to listen. Well, I mean, it's great hearing all the the different stories around Texas because I know the Navajo specifically is in regard to skinwalkers. So I'm pretty well versed on that but I, I love hearing all especially you know because i live in texas hearing hearing mm -hmm. everything that's going on around here and um it's interesting to hear you know the different stories of you know shapeshifters because of course yeah lots of nations have, or lots of tribes have them th their stories but i mean i didn't think it was as um widespread as it apparently is here in texas specifically yes yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a, another different kind of shapeshifter dealing with the natives, but 
is another another different kind. You know, you got the kind of ballistic, but you know, when all those those wars were happening that the that were fighting amongst each other, sometimes when they were being overwhelmed by the people that were killing them, what was happening to the the, the, the Wonkas or whatever when they were being attacked by all the natives? Instead of dying out of their hands, they would form a circle in which they would grab all the family members and make a circle. And what the head of the house would do was would cut each family's uh, each, each family member's wrist, but they were in the form of a circle. The legend says that when the sun will rise from all this spilled blood, that the one will come out of the center of the circle, which was a uh, a being, a dark being. It was a vengeful being because of what was happening and that he had the ability to use uh, Mother Nature itself to manifest. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the, the, the legends is called the one, you know, and it's, it's a, a shapeshifter but it's created out of sacrifice because it's like a blood sacrifice and it will come out of the center of that circle. Uh, the other circles that I know of is when somebody is sick and when somebody was dying, they will place rocks around the circle and the shaman would take his, his, his gear. You know, sometimes they would, would put uh, faces of, of deer or buffalo, so the mass that they were wearing, and they're going to the circle to either help the person that's sick or to help the person cross over, you know, uh, that's, that's already fixing to cross over. And if you notice, they change their faces to different kind of animals, you know, and when I run into the shapeshifters and the things that have caught on Elm's Grove, it was kind of confusing to me because you see the shaman wearing all these garments that look like this beast. And then I'm looking at the, the, the screenshots when I, when I capture something, and that's how is it shaman, is it shapeshifters, you know, skinwalkers, windigos, it, because it's all dealing with with blood, you know, or whether it's a flesh, where they're eating the flesh, or where somebody has killed, sacrificed themselves, but they want vengeance for their death, which is the one. And I think when you were talking about those giants in Oklahoma that uh, with a tree and the bark. I remember an incident where <clears throat> I had seen uh, like four or five of them walking towards uh, an open area in Elms Grove, and they were wearing like uh, some kind of druid-like thing, right? So I seen them go toward this this tree. So I went over there, but I didn't see nothing. I said, well, maybe just my imagination of the sun playing games with me. I had two little baby roosters, and they grew, you know, and I had to get rid of them. So I put them in a cage. I said, look, son, I'm going to leave them out here. I went to that tree. I put them in this tree for tonight, and then tomorrow we'll go find a home for them because I don't want to get in trouble by having uh, domestic animals in, in the park because the wheels didn't allow to have any. And we went back the following day. The cage was all messed up, and I'm looking. Something cut the heads off the, the, heads off the chicken, the, the, the heads it was two chicken, uh, two roosters. The heads were cut off, and the, the the bodies were gone. But the heads were cut off on a brick, right? And I'm like, well, what's going to cut the heads off and just leave the heads, but not not eat the whole body, you know? So we went back, and I went back to follow me to do more investigation. What was weird is underneath this tree, it was a huge tree. There was nothing underneath. It was. That's why I picked the tree. There was nothing underneath, no brush or nothing. But when I went back the following day, there was trees all underneath it that grew. They were about 13 foot tall. So I was like, there's no way. I was like 13, 13, 14 trees that grew underneath this big tree overnight. And I, and I started thinking about the blood of the chickens, right? There's something, you know, like a blood sacrifice of some sort. So I grabbed my machetes. And I started cutting the, cutting the trees off. They were like around pretty thick, like around that thick. As I cut the first tree, I noticed something. Blood came out of that tree. 
right? And I said, no, nah, just probably just my imagination. I went and got the other tree and blood came out of it. And I told my son because he was outside uh, on the on the grass waiting for me. I said, son, stay, stay back. And I started praying and I started cutting all the trees that were there and blood get, kept on coming out of the trees. It was 13, 13 trees that I cut and every tree had blood in them. If you go to Elms Grove in that area, they cut all the trees that were in that in that area except the tree where those trees grew. That tree is still there by itself. And it's right by Elms Grove. That they didn't cut that that old tree. It's still standing by itself. Hmm. Hmm. But I witnessed it, you know. I wish that there could have been somebody there to witness been there with me besides my son my son was already like i guess in fifth grade when this happened you know uh it's, it's it was crazy uh but i just prayed and i left you know maybe that's why a lot of things kept on happening because you know i was fighting them spiritually and i said well this is not good there's those trees that are going to grow 13 like 13 feet tall overnight you know there's no way in the world not unless somebody knows something else Mm -hmm. That there is trees that can grow within one day like that, you know. But uh, the what freaked me out was the blood that came out of them. It was red, and it's, the, it's still the stains on my mach on my machetes that I used. I had some Vietnam vet machetes that I used to cut them with, and but there's just some of the activity that I would just wanted to share with y'all about the the circle, the one, and. Mm -hmm. Cause I remember the time that I was walking at nighttime and I, I said, you know, what? I was by the airport and I turned back when I turned back and I was walking the same route because I was tired for the night before I walked like 18 miles a night as well, because I had a blood clot in my leg. Right. So as I'm walking, there's a, a formation of rocks that there are in the, on the middle of the street. I, I, I say there had to be like, 18 rocks pretty big rocks and i'm looking like how huh, what the i'm like in my mind i'm saying what the hell is this you know how did this form here so i'm looking and i thought somebody was messing with me you know and i had taken like maybe 20 30 steps and i turned back and there's no way that somebody could put that there so i was saying is anybody out here and nothing there was silence complete silence but i believe the native spirits that were around, they knew that I was sick with a blood clot in my leg. <coughs> so they were trying to get me to enter the circle to heal. That's what I thought. But then, you know, you have the, the other one where they have uh, the blood sacrifice. And it's like, I did. I just went around it. But I didn't know about the they form a rock formation to heal somebody that's sick or mm -hmm. uh, somebody that's dying. So either either war, I was sick and I, I might have been dying because the blood clot was pretty pretty humongous that I had. You know. I want to I want to say something about the chat here, Kid Flash, and I'm sure Kid, you you you're just you're, you're saying this something because you've been taught that. But Kid Flash says that the natives didn't own slaves. Well. I'm sorry to tell you that, but they did actually. And in, in, in particular, the five civilized tribes, which we know are the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Seminole, the Creek, and uh, the fifth one, the main one, the, the Cherokee. Those tribes in particular did own slaves. Not just that, but the Comanches owned slaves too. But the Comanches tended to incorporate them into their tribe and they just kind of took them as hostages. It wasn't the same as like, organized slavery but the five civilized tribes were into agriculture and th the commonly held myth is that they became agrarian after the, the the white man came to the united states that's not true because we know that from some of the the, the civilizations that they had um from the from the mounds that they built you know that, that they were they were farming way back now, there's some really interesting theories, and there's a guy named Robert Kreider. He's been on my show once before. I want to bring him back. And Robert and, and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, but these uh, different tribes may have come from other countries. I know that sounds weird. 
to think about. But not just the Polynesians that came here or the Asians that came from the Bering Strait, the land bridge, whatever. But I'm talking about different tribes that may have come from different places like Egypt, like right. the, the Hebrews right. that were Egyptian Hebrews. They were called Take the, the Hebron outsiders. Yeah, you know, Joe, we've talked about it too. You took the um, words out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. And so they were they were brought here by what could be considered an alien presence. But what we call aliens, we could also, that's for a Saturday mm -hmm. show, but <laughs> the dimensionals. Um, and Joe, yeah. if you want to jump on about that tomorrow, we can talk about that tomorrow if you want to come on. And we can, yeah, we can get into the whole thing. Yeah, we could, because that could be the subject for tomorrow. And so you look at like these uh, different, the DNA. One of the things that we learned from some of the Aztec descendants of the Aztecs, because there are no Aztecs left, they're all gone except there's the blood running through the veins of the people who still live in that area. And some of them, their DNA matches up to people from the Tamil culture of India. And the yeah. ziggurats, the same thing. The pyramids were made the same way. And some of these smaller ashrams and temples in India have the same look about them. And in fact, I was given a story by a guy uh, about it was a Cambodian and he was telling me a story and I was going to tell that story on, on the show last Sunday and I forgot about it, but his name is Troy. He's an Americanized Cambodian. I worked with him. I did security with him at another company and we worked together at a place called Taco Cabana, which was, believe it or not, a violent place because people would go there <laughs> to eat tacos and Abe and, and you know who, what this is, uh, guys from Texas here, Joe, um, yeah. Taco Cabana late at night is where a lot of people go, as Abe would say, borracho teresos. Because I guess the tacos are so good that they got to have some, uh, you know, so, some whatever to, to, to wash it down. They got to have some uh, Modelo Negro, you know, to, to drink it with. Yeah. And then it's crazy. And then it's time to like start dancing or whatever. But we had a lot of problems. And Troy was a pretty good fighter, and he was a kickboxer. So I got to know him pretty well, and he actually introduced me to a guy that ended up becoming one of my kickboxing coaches, thank goodness. Um, but really cool dude. But he told me a wild story not too long ago, because I stayed friends with people for decades, you know. Um, but we've been friends for a long time, and he says, hey, I know you got that show now. Don't forget about my story about the, the weird cigarettes in the jungles of Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge. It's a really, really interesting story. I'm going to tell you, folks. I'm going to tell it to you. But uh, we'll wait for all, Sunday for that. So just remember, Cam Cambodian temples. But uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, when, you, when you look at these different, uh, uh, the, the, the different tribes that had slaves or whatever, it was really those five tribes, but they learned it from the whites that had actually, they were owning slaves. And so they thought, hey, to be successful and wealthy, we should buy slaves too, because that's what the white man is doing. And uh, of course, they all, they all, and believe it or not, three of those nations actually, including the Cherokee, declared war on the Union and fought for the South. As much as people might want to say, oh, that didn't happen, and they want to whitewash history and change it around. No, that's what happened. Um, and here at PRT, I'm about the truth. And I'm not going to lie to you. And if it Sound, if it becomes uncomfortable or whatever, and I can't tell you the truth, then I'm going to leave. I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to come back. I'm going to go somewhere where I can tell the truth. But that is the truth. And I'm not bashing on anybody or I'm not here to pass judgment or whatever. Um, but I, I've said this before, too. The slave trade can, can be traced back to certain spots in North Africa. And it was really the Fulani uh, Muslim um, Africans that were their Nigerian. Uh, by, by nationality, but Nigeria wasn't a country at that time. And they were a very powerful tribe. And they would conquer the other tribes and they would sell them to the, to the Bedouins that would take them to the markets like Zanzibar and Tripoli. And they were a jumping off point where they would be picked up by most of the people that were Portuguese or Dutch. They tended to be Sephardic Jewish or Arabic, and they would take them to the New World. And that is how the slave trade really was. That's what happened. That's what fueled it. Most of them that were picked up by the Portuguese uh, were were sold to the Spanish. They had they were very close ties together, and they had the same religion and everything. So, but they were just they spoke a different language. That's all it is. And the Portuguese dropped them off in South America. Yeah. Now, most of Brazil was just a giant rainforest, and 
they didn't really go into the middle of it. They just stuck on the outside of it. What, what's going on, Joe? What happened? It's funny, man. Like every time I start thinking about it, like you, you just plug it in right there. I'm like, yeah. And then Brazil, and then you're like, and Brazil. And I'm like, <laughs> sorry, man. Um, yeah, no, so, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Okay, I just but so so the Dutch, the Dutch Sephardics tended to go to the north, and and that was in the New World, nor and and Raleigh. Uh, and then in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, those places were the jumping off points. And that's where a lot of the slaves were sold. Um, from. And so I've, I've read up on and studied the slave, the history of the slave trade. The Fulani Muslims are still to this day a very violent and, and aggressive group. Um, if you go to Africa, which I have, and I've been there twice, I've been to two different parts of it. You'll run into Fulani uh, Nigerians all over the whole continent in every country. I am not joking. And it's not just Boko Haram. Um, I'm telling you, you'll run into them. I was in South Africa and Pretoria and they were everywhere, like gangs, you know, um, because they spread out all over the entire uh, continent. And I, I asked some of the locals and I was like, you know, I was like, why? And I asked, there was some Zulu that were, I became really good friends with. And I asked them, I said, you're the original people from this this land. This is your land originally. Um, I mean, I'm talking all the way back to Shaka, you know, and I told them, I said, what, the, why are these Nigerians here, the Fulani, you know? And they were like, they came here to work. And I said, but they, and then one of them says, but they don't work. They're just a violent gangsters, basically. And so if you're a mercenary or if you're a person who's doing something, you know, whatever, you're probably going to encounter them quite a bit because they fight for the highest bidder in particular. And they they wage war all across Africa. Just a little side note. So, you know, I argued with somebody about how all oh, they they weren't they weren't slaves. They didn't they didn't have slaves. The Muslims didn't believe in it. I said they propped it up and created it. What are you talking about? Um, and then it was supported by other groups of people who were doing. And, and to me, slavery is bad. No matter how you look at it, it's something that is not good. And I give kudos to the British at least for that because they were one of the first European countries to outlaw it and ban it. Um, and they actually did stick by their guns. And whenever they would catch a slave ship, they would take the slaves off of the ship and then they would leave the, the, the people that were slavers on the ship and then they would sink it with them on it. Um, so that was something that they, that they did pretty regularly. So that is the one good thing, even though they were colonists and did other bad things, they did have some good points. Um, but anyway, I digress. We're, we're talking about the skinwalkers of Native and culture and legends and lore. If you if you look, speaking of with the South American natives, if you go to the Piaroas, now the Piaroa Indians. Uh, Joe, do you want to do you know about that? You want to take over on that, maybe? No, nah, I, I, I'm um, no, nah, I'd, I'd be lying if I said yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well the Piaroa Indians they have a belief in a, in a thing they call Anasazi. Anasazi is oh. a giant. Do you know what I'm going to say? I I. I I'm, I'm following you. Yeah, I, okay. I know the Anastasia. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so they actually can transform into what is called giant spiders, giant tarantulas. And they go into a trance like state by drinking ayahuasca. And there are legends and stories of people who claim that they have seen these people, the Piro, actually turn into giant spiders. Now, I'm not a big person like into pictures or whatever, but I believe it's in Daryl Denton's group. Um, Bigfoot believers only, or something like that. Bigfoot I believers and other creatures. Huge group, man. Huge group, man. He's mm -hmm. he's really built a group that's that's hell, man. It's it's crazy. Um, somebody posted a picture in that group, and it looks it's a Bigfoot laid out like a spider, and it's this big. But and, and, and uh, people have reported these Bigfoot creatures climbing up trees like spiders. Now, my good friend Jerry Williams, the Choctaw tracker, he would say. That's because, according to the Choctaw legend and tradition and the, and the creation myth, we say myth because, you know, that's what it is until, you know, whatever. But people can say everything is a myth. I'm not saying that they don't, they're not correct. But they believe that there was a spider that came to Earth and pierced the core of the Earth. It gets really convoluted. Go back and listen to the episodes with Jerry and Ella Williams. You'll hear what I'm talking about. Um so the Choctaw myth is that there was a giant spider that came here and sort of like laid eggs in the earth. <laughs> and some of them went down into the earth and the descendants of these 
uh, whatever, are actually living down within the earth. Now, that's another uh, tradition. The Guyanese people, they actually have a very similar tradition. And then there are Laplander stories of giant spiders that come out of these ice caves that look like they're made of crystal or something. Very, very weird stuff. Yeah, I see I see you, Monica, wrinkling your nose. You're like, what is yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. They can keep all the spider stories. Yep. Every <laughs> culture has them, though. And some cultures oh, yeah. believe that they can shapeshift. Now, the Bedouins of Morocco, a little different culture than the people uh, that, that, that are from the Levant. Now, the North African Bedouins live differently than the, than the Levantian. The Levantian Bedouins don't really have as much of a culture per se, as, as the, the Berber of Morocco. They have legends, too. And they believe that these things live within the earth and they can come up like giant sand beings or whatever and can eat your camel, can eat you, can kill you, can do all these things, and they can shapeshift into you. Um, but they are literally a spider. It comes from this yeah. like creature. Now you wonder why the spider has so many, and, and everybody's going to say the same thing. Well, they're creepy and they're ugly, and well, they just look unsavory. Like it's not something that. But the pierroa also they eat them. They do. I think the giant tarantula is a delicious food. Um, so <laughs> catch them. What they do is they'll take a little, a little stick, and they'll roll them around in the hole, and then yeah. the spider comes out to see what it is, and they catch them, and they pin pin them down like this pick them up, and then they pin the, the, the legs back, keeping the humongous one-inch-long fangs away from them, and then they wrap them in these big banana leaves, and then they close them up, and then they keep them fresh, and they take them. They, they, they travel with them. They take a thorn, and they close it up. They, they, don't, they use everything organic, and after they get about 10 or 12 of them, they go back home, and then they, they flip them over, and they puncture the abdomen, effectively killing the spider, flipping the banana leaf over, opening it up, and the spider sprawls out, and it's laying there lifeless. They can pick it up and mess with it, and it doesn't move. They know it's dead. And they take it, and they burn it on a fire, flip it over a few times. This is to get rid of the hair because yep. the hair is particularly nasty. You don't want to eat the hair. I wouldn't want to eat any of it. But these people, <laughs> they believe in it. They like it, right? And so tastes like eating, chicken. Tastes like chicken. Right? Everything tastes like chicken. <laughs> So the hair, you see these spiders, if you look them up, the giant tarantulas, they will flip their abdomen and they'll fling hair at you and it will actually impale into your skin. They also are known to go to the creek and drink water like a dog. I'm not joking. I've seen this with my own eyes. And then they will actually hiss at you like, mm -hmm. make a noise. And I'm not kidding. This is a very amazing creature. And I've had the the displeasure, I guess you could say, of being from here to my computer screen from one. And they were like, oh, it's lifeless. Touch it. And I'm like, no, thank you. I'm good. I'll take your word for it. But I'll tell you what. I will watch you poke it with a stick because I'm not even going to try to poke it with a stick. Um, but that's, they're, they're amazing people. And it's an amazing uh, thing what they do. But they believe 100%. They have one to two people in each of their unit tribes who are considered to be medicine men and have the ability to travel into the astral plane. And they can sometimes come out of the astral plane as a physical being known as a spider and a tzatzi. Yeah. So you got to be real careful because sometimes somebody pisses somebody off, giant spider comes, crawls, and takes them out of their window, whatever. Yeah. Just saying... I mean, that's the legends, that's the stories. Now, me personally, I haven't ever seen this, but I've yeah. heard of this. And so you got to be real careful. Thank you for that donation, Two Shadows. Everybody that's donated, I've been uh, neglecting that. Sorry about that. But uh, I appreciate it, everybody who donates. We are really, really uh, thankful for this. We had, yeah, we did get our, uh, one of our cameras, but we still have two others we have to get. And we have some equipment and stuff. And I'm supposed to be hitting the LBL at the end of the month. Hopefully you'll be there, Krista, too. Yep, and um, whoever wants to go is welcome to go. I'm going to be meeting up with my dear friend, uh, Barton Nunley. And, um, yeah, hopefully I can get Ken on board. I'm trying to – Ken says there's too many people going there now, and it's turned into Disneyland. I said, I think it's still pretty wild. I think we should check it out. There's a, we, we know places to go, and there's nobody around. I, is, I is there going to be spiders involved? <laughs> <laughs> 
Probably. <laughs> well, let, let, let's hope not, but it is that time of year where they're starting to come out. Well, I've so, seen the picture uh, of what he's talking about, the uh, supposedly a bit for low to the ground. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't something yeah. like that, but what I wouldn't is was no something. It was always coming running to me on that path, and it would stop. And like every time I go through the path, I could hear running through the, breaking the branches, and it would stop. Then one day I was going to the store because it was a shortcut to go to the store, and the sun was setting. It was still sunlight, and I heard something come out of the bush. So I turn up. Turn, when I turn around, I seen something low to the ground, like like very low to the ground. You, but it was like nothing yeah, but muscle. Yeah, like just, you know how you got you do the low crawl, mm -hmm. yep. but like low and the, the the legs wasn't the knees or the the way it was shaped, it wasn't touching the ground. It was just using nothing but muscle, and it was looking back and forth. Uh, the ears that it had, it had like black in the ears, and they were vibrate they were vibrating like it was sensing, and I could see the eyes, and the the eyes were white. So I was like, I looked at it and he just moved and said left to right. And I'm not moving because I'm like, what the hell is that? You know, I'm frozen. And I don't want to move. But as it was sensing me, it kind of like sent a, uh, what do you call it? Like a, like a wave of something to, it, it made me feel like the world went upside down on me. Some kind of signal, I guess, to, to send what was around. And it felt like, uh, like I flipped up upside down. But I was still standing, and it was just moving. It said I didn't move still, and then it just went into the, into the woods. And I said, I'm not going to follow because it was big. It, it covered the whole path, you know. Uh, it had light brown fur. It had, like, black dots on his body. And I know it was no wildcat <laughs> or no cougar because it looked like a human <laughs> Uh, the only thing I could think of was because the nose, the nose, the way it was shaped, looked like like a bat, like a bat in some kind of way. The way it was shaped. The only thing that came to my my mind when I witnessed this was an Asperatu. or you know, like I said, shape shifter. But it was that was that one looked different than the other ones that I've seen. But they do have this capability. And where it went to. There's, there's this. I'll, sh I'll place a picture of my group. There's a, a cement block that stands up out of the ground, and the the metal plate was moved to the side. I'm thinking it went down inside there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. No. Um, yeah. No, that just got me thinking because uh, I've I've uh, read a lot of encounters or viewed a lot of encounters where it's like the the sasquatch will do that it'll like go flat and almost like walk on just its fingers and its toes mm -hmm. but it'll literally flatten out spider dna type aspect mm -hmm. um you know and then you got the you got that sonic speech you know that that um contorts your your inner ear so you lose balance you don't know up and down down is up blah blah, blah. so like both of those that you were just saying Abe. um like it is a very big commonality upon uh, experiences that people witness. So that's why that's what pushes my belief to the fact that um, not just not just Bigfoot, but the dog man. I think it's it's multiple um, DNAs of spiritual existence that that comes and creates and manifests this thing. So. It, Maybe kind of like, and someone is in the chat talking about it. Maybe it's not, um, you know, because we think of things of, of a mortal fashion, right? You know, you think of it as a mortal existence and birth and and life and death. But if this is like almost like a fear manifestation, what is your biggest fear? Is it going to come to you as? you know, a giant reptilian, is it going to come to you as a spider? Like what? Mm -hmm. Cause they're, they're energy feeders, you know what I mean? And that's, that's, and it's demonic, you know, it's straight up. Like, and if anyone disagrees with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just personally believe that it's not a, it's not a, um, a mortal thing. This is a, 
either interdimensional or a demonic thing that is designed to terrify and to uh, mm -hmm. you know obstruct your your vision of what you think life is and that's the most terrifying thing in the world yeah you know what I mean? like you think my you ears know, were like my ear it missed my my senses like it threw off my senses big time and it, it, like i said it felt like it, I, I went upside down like the the everything went like everything yeah. flipped on me like the earth was going upside down right, right. I mean that's you know? that's the whole that's the whole purpose of like roller coasters and stuff like that is because it scares the crap out of you because you're not you're not used to that. So you know we do it for entertainment purposes, but you know, but what it really is is, is pulling fear. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it was weird. well the way it was low to the ground like that. That that low is like in the military we call it. We, you know we call it uh, got the low crawl. When you're Army sneaking up on it. onto the yeah. enemy, you know you go low crawling so they won't see you. That's how low it was, but it was huge. And the way it was moving its head, like it was using its ears as a sonar, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. It couldn't see me because the eyes were high. It couldn't see me. The sun was out. So I'm thinking they might come out at night because they're night hunters, you know, or Maybe whatever it was. Because the you freaks know. come out at night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta tell you something. Somebody was in the chat and they were talking about the Aztecs having been credited with creating the rubber ball. This is not a rubber ball, but it made me think of it. And actually, the Mayans would be the first to have actually in, in Mesoamerica used a rubber ball and they used it to play a game called Pits. And if you don't know what that is, well, it's not important. What it is is a game of death. And if yeah. you, you died and you had your head chopped off. And it goes back, and the Popol Vuh is actually the record of the Mayan people. And if you go back and you look, there were two brothers. One's name was Zabal, Zabalinke, and the other one's name was Hun, Hun, Hun Pu, some, some something. I don't want to butcher the name. But anyway, they played a game with the god of the underworld. And the god of the underworld, who's often described as a spider. I mean, he comes up crawling up out of some hole, and his name was Vukub uh, Kame or K K something, some weird name. Anyways, he comes up out of the ground and challenges them to a game. And the, the whole object of the game, and it's really crazy if you look at this, they have it at Chichen Itza in Mexico. The, the hole is a little bigger than that. And they got this ball that you got to fit through. It's like 30 feet up in the air, and you can't use any part of your, you can't kick it or hit it with your arms or legs. So they played this game, and if the captives that were taken captive, if they could manage, which is damn near impossible, to get that ball to hit and make it, then you lived. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> Sadly enough, nobody could really do it. Mm -hmm. And so that was their, their offering to Kukulkan, which would be the, the considered their, their main deity. And he needed the blood because it's thirsty work having to fight uh, Voku Kumaro, whatever his name was, who was really just a giant spider. But the snake was created according to their creation myth. With, with when one of the brothers, I can't remember which one it was, but he was decapitated by the bad guy from the inner earth, the spider dude, whatever. He he decapitated him, and that from his head was was turned into the first ball. Now, think about this. This guy decapitated him. And they used his head as the ball. So in, in honor of him, the, the one of the founders, the two brothers, the twins, the, the ball was used. That was in memorial of him. It was his head. But his torso, right. the blood from his torso uh, went down into the earth and out sprang up these giant snakes. And in some legends and myths, there were snakes and spiders and other creatures that came out. But if you think about it, if this bad guy that comes from the inner earth and some of the legends say that he was like this uh, deity that was made up of many different creatures, but they all kind of came forth from this crawling thing that came from the underworld. So right. you got to wonder, like, why is that the theme that comes up over and over again? And it's very prominent in a lot of creation myths, like when Jerry Williams talks about the Choctaw myth. Now, there was a guy that was insulting him one day and goes, oh, yeah, your stupid belief in the spider and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I defended him, and I said, well, when you think about it, his culture is not the only one that believes in these giant spiders that settled down within the earth 
And according to some people that I had talked to recently, one who had claimed that he was, a, you know, practice vampirism, he claimed that there were different levels within the inner earth. And at the core of the inner earth, according to what the black book that they believe in, mm -hmm. is that there is a spider-like being that weaves the web of all reality down there and creating the illusion that we all live in. Now, think about this too. This is interesting. The whole internet, whatever, it's all interconnected. What is it called? The web. <laughs> the internet is called the world, the world wide, wide web. web. You're, you're, you're li living in the spider's web. We're living in the spider's time. And there are people who are unaffected by the disgustingness of a spider. I'm not one of them. I hate spiders with a passion, a purple passion that you would not imagine. You can't even believe how much I despise them. We know that eight legs, eight arms, whatever, is a very, very useful, uh, you know, adaptation. Now, if you don't believe in evolution, then call it adaptation. Call it whatever the hell you want. But cephalopods have used it to great effect. And in my personal opinion, they are some of the smartest creatures on Earth. We also know that they don't really share any DNA with anyone else on the planet other than other cephalopods. And some would say, well, what about the cuttlefish? That's an arthrocephalopod. It's still a cephalopod. I'm, whatever. I'm not going to argue about it. It's semantics. But the point is that it's a very, very useful and viable mode of transportation. It's something that is very, very, very common. And I believe that if you were to travel to other planets, hypothetically, let's say that other planets do exist the way that they say they do. Let's say that they are outer space, alien, whatever. I guarantee you that all throughout the entire galaxy, there will be four legs and eight legs because it is a very, very useful adaptation. Now, when a, when a Bigfoot type creature, which I believe or in between some sort of subnature in between realities, you know, gets down and spider crawls. It's back to its natural state. It is right. doing what its predecessor, the spider, taught it to do. It is literally checking itself into the ex, ex, uh, insectoid part of its brain, which is somewhere below, below and behind the amygdala, which I, it's my opinion, my belief, and people want to believe me, don't. We access the reptilian part of our brain all the time. And that's why so many species of reptilians exist throughout this entire galaxy or whatever. And within the inner earth, because reptilians are very common. They're one step before us, mammals. Mammals are much, much more complex. You have the large four-chambered heart. You have all these different things that could and can go wrong, and the DNA is weird and whatever. But reptilians are a lot more simple. What's a step below them? Bugs. Right. Bugs. Bugs are even more simple. A spider is, a, is just a complex version of a bug. That's all it is. But to think that these beings don't really think and have brains like everybody else is ridiculous because they still don't seem to be able to find a brain on some of these crawfish. Like, you know, like, but we know that they feel pain. They have something that resembles a nervous system. So, I mean, there's obviously something going on there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that having a brain or a heart or any of that is what makes you a living being. It's about having a soul. soul. And I think that everything on earth has a soul. And I believe that something somewhere down the line created us, however people want to believe. Some people will be on one side, some people will be on the other. Um, but whatever it is, whatever gave us life and breathed it into us, I call it God. Some people say something else. But here's what I'm going to tell you. All of us are connected. And somewhere down the line, we are all related. And when people can eventually come to the realization that we are all one, we all speak with one voice. We are this whole planet is just one drop of water that came out of the, the pail. You know, um, it's just we're all connected, and we all have that in us. And and when you look at the the creation myths and legends or whatever, they all have a commonality, a common thread. And people can say that well, that's ridiculous. These creatures are not the same. They're not this. They're not that. Yes, they are. There's not a whole lot of difference between a shark, a human, and a spider. Yeah, an amoeba is a shapeshifter. You it can is. change forms. An amoeba. Yep. A single cell creature. You know, if you were to, to take a cell and look at it under a microscope, you are made up of thousands, or it's millions, billions of cells millions. that can inter that can do things independently of one another. 
I watched a video one time of a bear, and it this said, "This you're looking at," and I believe it was, I think it was David Attenborough. He's like, "This you're looking at is a bear. Doesn't look like a bear. <laughs> you're looking at its cells inside it's of one of the animal's glands, of course." So you're looking at a bear, and I'm like, "Wow!" And there they are, inching like this, little dudes, man, like like on Nintendo, like Pikmin. I don't know if you've ever played that. But, you know, you got the little yeah, yeah. moving around, yip, 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 you know, those are the cells that are actually repairing some damage that was done to this animal. They look like little beings. They look like the Fresno crawlers. And it's really weird. It's like yeah, little nanobots. <laughs> yeah, like nanobots. Yeah. And when you look at the, the crawler, it could be the preform <laughs> to all of this. The song that my wife yeah. wrote about the, the skinwalker that we, we played earlier, at one point he says, I am the crawler. He says that. Why? Because people see them doing that. There are stories all over these reservations of these dudes that get down and they crawl around, like flatten themselves out and go into holes and stuff. The I mean, rakes. The rakes. The rakes. Or, or yeah. crawlers also. The rakes. Huh? It's a pre-skinwalker. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's the and, that, and, and that's that's literally how you did when we were kids, man. I remember, you know, going out to Walnut Creek out in Austin, man. And that's what you Walnut do is Creek. you take you, you, you know, yeah, you take some, uh, well, they didn't have bottles of water back then, but you took cups of water and stuff and you'd pour the, the water in the little hole and then that would pull the tarantulas up. So, yeah, that's it, right. You know, it's the same thing, you know. So somebody asked a question here. His brother Heck, he says, Wolf, do you believe the Vikings came to America before England? Yes. Simple answer, yes. We also, I also believe that the Chinese came here, um, and I believe it was during the Han Dynasty because there was a royal decree by one of the, the Han leaders who said, and I believe it was the second uh, emperor, um, and now it's different how they say because there, were, there was a leader, then there was an emperor, and it was kind of like Rome became a republic. It's Anyway. The point is, he wasn't the second leader. He was just called the second ruler. Um, but here's the thing. He made a decree, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, go look it up. But he said that he needed to know what the entirety of the world was. Now, they believe that the world was on the back of a giant turtle. And before you say, yeah, yeah. oh, those people, they're crazy. Have you seen the back of a giant turtle shell? <laughs> giant turtles actually have the lunar calendar on their back. <laughs> I'm not joking. They, do. they really no, do. You're not. Yeah, you and do. there's 13 months, and then there's 364 days, and I'm not kidding. That's the absolute truth. And you're gonna think Wolf's just he's this crazy guy, right? I'm full of crap. No, 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 no. I'm serious as a heart attack. Now, why I have all this information, I don't know. But the point is that it's real. It's legit. And they said that this giant turtle is actually being walked by four elephants. <laughs> you're thinking this is so crazy. Until you start to realize, take a look at their feet. I mean, I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff there. Just go look it up. But he said, I need to know the entirety of this, this fishbowl that we live in. So he sent people all over the Pacific Ocean, all over the Atlantic Ocean. And me and my good friend, Jason McLean, we went around the horn last Saturday till it was just me and him left. And we had this long show. And guess what? Jason, he said something. He said, you know... Um, if you look at, like, well, I forgot the way he worded it. We were talking about, like, um, wow, oh, man, it was toward the end of the show, and we were talking about, like, uh, the, like we were talking about the people that came to the, the, the New World, and, and I said something about the Chinese anchor that was found off the Gulf of, of Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico, near the Yucatan. And he was he was saying something, I forgot what he said, but anyway... The, the whole conversation was very interesting. Go back and listen. We talk about ancient civilization and where we came from and all this other stuff. And Jason had all kinds of amazing things to say. Him and Dr. Bertram. Dr. Bertram is another one. He's a really good guy. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with him. I know you are, Chris. Oh, yeah. But I don't know. Monica, are you familiar with him? I'm familiar with the name, but it's not yeah. ringing. Well, it would be something for you. Get, get him on your show for sure. Okay. Jason and Dr. Bertram, both of them are really good. Um, but we were sitting there talking about this, and you know, it, it, I don't believe that that the first people that came to the New World or, or from the Old World were was the, the Spanish. I just don't believe that. I believe that we were visited many, many times over here, 
and event, and there was all kinds of people that came. There were different incursions from all sorts of different civilizations, and I believe that the Chinese were one of them. And I believe that yeah. it all predated Columbus. And that's all my right. opinion. I'm sorry, I can't remember what me and Jason were actually talking about, but we had a really good conversation toward the end there. You know, there was just me and him. Um, we had a good conversation all the way around. Saturdays are incredible, but so you're very quiet, yeah. Martha, and I don't want to monopolize all the time with my big mouth. So what do you got going on? I need you to say something. Come on. Hey, man, I'm going to jump in when I have something intelligent to say. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't bode well for you to have to show. I'm like, enjoying listening to the stories right. here because I'm there's so you. much information coming mm-hmm. that I, I mean, if I'll hop in if I if I really do, if I have something to mm-hmm. contribute, I will happily hop in. Yeah, I'm the same way. I didn't realize like, you know, and, you know, every week I do watch your show, shows, Josh, and, and I learn so much and just sitting here listening, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I feel I, bad. I'm Somebody just, just said, I that. kind of feel bad for the guests. They don't get to talk much. Laugh out loud. Josh is a wealth of info like an encyclopedia. Well, I'm going to be bad quiet. for us. I'm like, I'm like, uh. Monica here. We have something to say. We'll definitely jump in. I got a story for y'all. What happened to me uh, when I was around 16? I had lost my mother at a young age and I was going to, I was walking to go to visit my aunt and uh, I was going down the block and the church was up ahead, the Catholic church. And as I was walking, it was around 10, 10 30 at night. I could feel something be- beside me. When I looked, I seen something uh, walking over the fence. It was that tall. It had the body of a human, but the face of a werewolf. Then I looked to my right, and I see another one walking on the other side of, you know, it's, it's a street, and there's houses, so they're jumping over the fences. So I I freak out and I go to the to the church, the Catholic church. You got the the, the house of the priest. So I go banging on his door, you know, because I, they're following me. <clears throat> and he he gets me and he takes me into the to the room of the church. And I'm telling them that that I seen this this being this, this that, that was half human and he had the face of a of a, a wolf or you know, and he's like, "Are you on drugs?" I said, no, sir. I was going to visit my aunt. And uh, he's like, have you been drinking? And I said, no, sir. And then he's sitting down in front of me and he's telling me that it's probably just my imagination playing games. So, you know, his name was Father Ralph and he's got glasses on. As he told me that, I could see through the reflection of his glasses as the door open. And the things that were following me were right there looking at him. Father Ralph started sweating from his face and sweat was just dripping down his face. Instead of trying to help me out spiritually, he says, leave. The door closes. So I'm like, he's telling me to leave the the church. So I I run, bum rush the door and jump out there with my guards up, but there was nothing there no more. I ran to my aunt's home. And I could still feel something following me. I made it there. But what happened at my aunt's house, I do not remember. All I know is this, that somebody said something to me, and that's all I remember. Uh, I don't remember nothing. When I wake up, I'm at my house, and I have a knife in my hand, and it's got blood. And I don't know what, what happened, right? My my cousins come and tell me, hey, my mom doesn't want you coming to the house no more because of what happened last night. I was like, what happened last night? I don't, I don't remember nothing. So, well, you started beating up this guy and you started tossing everybody around and we're breaking chairs on you, two by fours on you. And we couldn't stop you, you know, and I don't remember nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yes, okay, I'll tell her that I'll respect that. Then the guy showed up that supposedly I hurt, and he was black and blue from the face. And he told me, hey, I'm sorry for for provoking you. I don't even know what happened. 
but I felt that whatever was following me that had to they look part human and horrible for a demonic in nature, and they uh, you could say possessed me in a, in a way where they used me because I had a, a spiritual opening. I believe the spiritual opening I had at the time is I had a lot of anger and vengeance in me, and it uh, it, it attacked. You know, Father Ralph left the ch left that the church like not even a week. He got his paperwork to transfer out of that that town. But mm -hmm. that happened to me. Uh, the knife that had the blood, I found out where that one came from too. Because you know when you you lose conscience and you you're trying to remember things. I remembered that I was walking by a like little placing little pictures that I was walking by this house and I feel bad about this because, you know, I have to live with, with this for the rest of my life. Uh, there was, a, uh, I know <clears throat> there was this guy at work and he said that his dog was missing <laughs> and he lived right by the church. I remember this little dog attacking me and the rest it had to do with that knife. And the little dog lost his life. Uh, but I remember this little parts. You know, that's something that I have to, I was, that I have to live for the rest of my life. Uh, but I felt that whatever was following me attacked me spiritually. And he used me in that manner to hurt people that I love, you know. And I never told the guy about his dog. It was a little chihuahua. But I remember what happened. You know, when people say that they they got possessed, or that they say the devil made me made me do it. Well, that that evening, I don't remember nothing of what happened till later on. And you know, I start remembering little bits and pieces, little bits and pieces, little bits and pieces of what happened that evening. Mm -hmm. But that's something that happened to me when I was sixteen years old. And you know. On that, on that note, so I have a friend um, who lived in the Sally House in Atchison, Kansas, Tony Pickman, and um, something similar happened with him as did you, but he he uh, he was definitely possessed, but it was um, his wife's cat that he actually killed, but he has no remembering of it. So I do believe, you know, because that house is very, very demonic. You know, like you definitely had some sort of demonic attachment there when you were 16 years old, you know, because exactly what you said is yeah. what Tony said. And it's it's actually in their book. Yeah, it's, you know, certain things, events that happened to me like that. Uh, but I remember that I was, you know, when you get spiritually, I actually remember, you know, I remember one where. <coughs> I was around seven, sixteen, seventeen, and start, somebody starts telling me something about somebody, and next thing you know, I start acting different, like I'm not myself, and I'm trying to pray within myself, and I start coughing up, throwing up, black stuff's mm -hmm. coming out of my mouth, you know, like just throwing up and throwing up and throwing up. But I know how it is to be spiritually attacked, but. Like I said, I had a lot of vengeance and a lot of anger in my heart. And thank God that I asked God for forgiveness and he forgave me. And, uh, you know, I found my love foundation. But it's not its not a good feeling being spiritually attacked. Mm -hmm. Like I said, when, when, when you have unforgiveness and, 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 and vengeance and hatred and you don't know about the unforgiveness, the feeling of having a black heart compared to Having a love foundation and finding a higher power to guide you is is awesome feeling. But yeah, I was going through a lot, you know, when I was growing up, you know, and it was all dealing with the same thing of me, uh, with me, of uh, went out to Mexico with a curandera and all that, in which I've been fighting spiritually all my life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's not a good feeling. So uh, in, in, in saying that, right, I wonder if this Tawankas or the natives, if they were getting 
so in some kind of way demonically possessed and being used in that manner by doing the acts that we're doing just just a thought yeah. mm -hmm. no i i agree man like when i when i was a kid like um i'm totally not the same cat that that i was when i was a kid and i'll put it that way you know what i mean like straight up like i was a i was a very troubled youth uh very <clears throat> angry and harbored a lot of negative energy and it it, it did the same thing you know it it um, cast a lot of negative actions and reactions out of me that i've grown to let go and, and you know turn myself over to you know to god about uh because back then you know when you when you're upset about you know the issues that you have in life and and the way you grew up and stuff like that you you tend to blame it you know what i mean and you don't really tend to look for um for help you know what i mean you, you, a, kind of, you hold you it, live yeah. an opening an opening right. you know that's yeah. what i had a, a big spiritual opening i didn't know then but i know now right yeah, yeah. it's not it's not a good feeling being used you know Right. In that no, matter, it's not, it's not. Yeah, yeah, and 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 then you do you. But one of the the one of the things that helped with me with uh, is is knowing what I did, you know, and and not ever wanting to do anything like that again. You know, it was it was a point of, um, I guess uh, mournfulness about it, or reminiscence about it, or what do you remorse about it? you know that that made me go dude i never want to be that person again so like now i'm a lot uh <laughs> i'm a lot less uh um susceptible to the negativity you know i mean i'm just like any other normal human being mm -hmm. but it's I, I don't carry that that weight of the world you know i i, I use god to lift me above the world mm -hmm. and yeah. to bring me out you know it's kind of like these things that are around us you know they know they know what we're about like right. i've been in combat and i've had to do things in combat so they know that what i've done and sometimes you know when a thought comes into my mind and it's a bad thought that there is trying to put a negative thought because of what i've been through in combat or whatever like trying to make me look like i'm a bad person because what i had to do in combat i rebuke it in jesus christ then yeah. you know so because, you know, when you're asking for forgiveness, God has already forgiven you. So we shouldn't right. we shouldn't feel bad about anything. We should just move on forward with our lives. Yeah. And the thing, too, like these demonic entities, you know, they're they're patient. They're patient. They'll wait. Yeah. You know, they'll catch you at your lowest when you're at your lowest point. That's when they they attack. Yeah, I had lost my mother. She had gotten uh, murdered wow. by my father. It was a domestic violence. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot of activity that happened then. Uh, when there was a lot of demonic activity happening for mm -hmm. for years before that happened, uh, we used to go work up north in East Texas in, in a small town called Anton, Anton, Texas. It was in between Anton and Littlefield. We live in a ranch, and we were labor workers. We go work in the cotton field. So there was old forts, and you know, I've always been spiritually in tune, so I would see a lot of things out there. Then uh, one day at our house, you know, when it was nighttime, I was always seeing this shadow figures, you know, coming towards uh, near the home and they'll stand by the trees. And sometimes they'll get the shadow figures to have red eye shine. And I will tell my mother, you see that, you see that. And it's like, oh, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. But then one day, you know, I heard my mother talking to somebody. She was talking to somebody through the window. And when she finished talking, I said, who are you talking to, mom? She's like, it's my dad. I'm talking to my dad. But you see, her dad had already been deceased. Wow. He said, he, I said well, what did he tell you? He said, to be careful on the path that you travel because when, something can happen within the next couple of months. That's, that was a message that he was given to her, right? So this, this, there was a lot of violence happening and a lot of negative stuff happened through violence. So I remember these things that were standing by the wood line around the ranch, 
came around the home and they were looking through the windows. They had red eyes. They were huge. You know, people want to call them Sasquatches. Go ahead. But to me, they were more of demonic of nature because, you know, when the, uh, the, the, the violence that was happening. Yeah. And energy. The only yeah. thing we could do was pray, right? Until they could stay out, but they would be right there by the windows. The go around our home. Then it was one evening uh, where I was asleep and I was having a dream that I was falling in a, in a pit. So I imagined in my dream to that I was going to land on something soft. So when I bounced, right, I bounced in the dream. I, uh, I woke up. So when I woke up, it's like my face was pressing on something. And I thought I was on the ground. So when I opened my eyes, I was elevated. My body was on the ceiling. And my brother was laying my, on the bed. My brother see me on top of the ceiling, still elevated by an unseen force. My, my brother jumped out of the bed and took up running out of the room. When that happened, my whole body just got slammed on the ground. I fell. Wow. You know, what can elevate you? Was it something that was as an identified object or was it something that was demonic? Mm -hmm. I believe it was something that was demonic, you know, whatever they were trying to do. Uh, the only thing I could do is, is when I bounce on the ground is going to prayer because I was already seeing all the activity that was happening around us. Mm -hmm. But to make a long story short, when we came back home, the summer finished, we came back home and that's when everything happened. So with my mother, mm -hmm. but this is, this unseen forces, demonic activity is very real, you know, when the shapeshifter, the shape shift into this animals or they, they change it into different forms or talking different languages. I believe they do all that for the, for the fear factor, you know, and that's the, the source from that. That's for no chromacy and witchcraft, which is demonic. That's where they get their powers from. Uh, and that's why this demonic beings, you know, I call them DDNs, disembodied demonic Nephilim, which are demons. They have the capability because they're the part demonic and they're you know and they have the capabilities to check to manifest into different forms in which mm -hmm. they can turn into your loved one they can turn into your pet they can turn into somebody you might know uh mimic their voices mm -hmm. my mom passed away in 1985 or when everything happened right 2016 my dog is barking outside i go outside I lived in a mobile home park. Uh, the, the, there's a trailer home there, and there's somebody sitting in my neighbor's uh, little bench. And I'm looking, and I was like, oh, it's a woman. So the woman stood up, walked down the steps, and stood right there on the curb looking at me. And I went to the gate, and I looked, and I said, there's no way. And I said, there's no way. You know, I'm looking at her. She's looking at me and got a smile looking at me. I went straight into prayer because what I was witnessing was my mother and there's no way in the world that that was my mother mm -hmm. so what i did i started praying to our father and she whatever it was went in between the mobile home park and was going walking parallel i was walking parallel on my street and it was in another street and as i was walking and i was kept on praying it just disappeared mm -hmm. but they had those capabilities you know to manifest you know imagine how many People that are missing from the 401 cases, children and, and people that get, go into the woods and get lost. How do we know that maybe they're following somebody that's in a manifestation of somebody that they know and they're getting yeah. taken deeper into the woods because they have those capabilities to manifest, you know? Yeah. I'm just talking spiritual deep, deep here that they have those capabilities. Mm -hmm. Little kids missing taking the following their mom or their dad into the woods, but they're following something that's manifesting or shape-shifting to look like them yeah. imagine that or yeah, uh, yeah. somebody somebody's yeah. following a voice come here come here and it, it sounds like their mother or their father and next thing you know they're gone yeah yeah no well, there, even, there's that go, go ahead, go ahead. Um, i'm sorry i was just going to say you know even the same thing when people do like paranormal go ghost hunting and they have all the equipment you know and voices come through, you know, on a ghost box or something, you know, 
as like their loved ones. And I think that's how a lot of people get sucked into this because they don't know what they're doing. They go to these, these places, these haunted locations, use this equipment and they think it might be their grandma or their mom or whatever, you know, that's coming through. And it's not, you know, it's something they're laying and waiting. Yeah, because he knows he knows what they're thinking spiritually. Exactly. Spirit knows spirit, so he knows exactly how to come at them. For yep. what? For the belief factor. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because well, of the spirit yeah. open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was that that there's one uh what was it a missing four one one case where it was like a two year old kid. Y'all might know this one. Um I think uh David Pilatus did it, uh but it was uh like a, he was found, and then afterwards they were like, he was like, told his grandma, "Oh, I like you so much better than my other grandma," and it turned out that was the grandma that led him to the cave or whatever. And, oh, that was and, at Mount Shasta. Yeah, yeah Mount I remember Shasta. something about yeah. that. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, same kind she of, was, same yeah. kind of game. She, yeah. she woke him up and lured him into the cave and mm -hmm. asked him yep. to defecate on paper yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah they, they they exist uh in elms grove when uh they can mimic the voices of my friends well i could be sitting in the in the park bench just just relaxing trying to meditate and, and you know train my senses next thing you know i hear like a rock being thrown that's like uh you know just probably a rock that fell from the ridge that's there in the creek and then next thing you know i hear hey abe it's me coming from the creek and it's dark. And I say, is that you, Bill? And I say, yeah, it's me, come over here. And in my mind, I'm like, wait a moment. I just talked to you on the phone that you made it to Pennsylvania. <laughs> right. She's in Pennsylvania, told me she, because she got married and she made it to Pennsylvania where she was gonna go live with her husband. And I had I got a phone call like four hours ago, you know, that she made it to Pennsylvania safely. And I hear her voice calling me to go to the creek. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's, yeah. those are the games that they play. You could, uh, in there, in those girls, you can sit in there because they know, it's kind of like they know my spirit, they know what I'm about, they know what I've been through. So the guy could be sitting there and I could hear somebody yell my name from the woods and it echoes through the park and it's coming out of the woods. And then it'll uh, they start laughing. You can hear the laugh, like a, like a woman laughing or a man laughing, and it echoes through the park. Very eerie and wicked. And I say, okay, it's time for me to go. I do the sign of the cross and I start praying to our Father and just walk back home. Mm -hmm. But they can mimic voices. They can mimic the voices. Yeah. Uh, another thing, you know how they, 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 they put the picture of the spider. That's low to the ground. One thing that I witnessed that they like to climb trees also. So when they're looking down, looking for footprints, they really need to look up on top of the trees because they might be looking at them from on top of the trees. Uh, the shapeshifters or skinwalkers or the, whatever they want to call them, dogman, Bigfoots. They climbed the, the acorn trees in Texas where I was sitting in a, at a picnic table at the park and my nephew was wanted to join the military. So I'm giving him advice you know, what to do to join. And as we're sitting on the picnic table, a big old branch just breaks and the branch lands right behind me or behind us. As it, as it broke, something landed right beside us too. And, and not just the branch, something landed on twos. It's looking at me and I'm looking at it. It's looking down at me because it's pretty tall. It's like a brownish and it's the, the face looks like a kind of like a like a cat of some sort. It looks at me and then it runs up on twos into the creek and breaks branches. And you can hear running in the water. Then he runs, breaks more branches, comes back into the park, and he's running on twos straight through the park on twos, running like a person would run. You know, so yeah, I've, I've witnessed a lot of. Uh, shapeshifters and all that there in, in Elms Gomer area. Uh, I don't know if they're manifesting because of the, that night I was hearing something on the tree. I was hearing like, like scratches. I said, oh, it's one of those tree lizards, you know? And you're hearing like, I'm hearing like claw marks, like something's clawing the tree. I said, ah, oh, just a lizard. You know, one of those, uh, the, the lizard trees with the spikes on its back. 
no, like when it, that happened, I was like, whoa, my, my nephew seen it too. Was like, whoa, what, what is that? You know, and we ran back in and we ran through. So it's kind of like when they manifest like that, like you, you don't know if you're seeing something that's real because he has the ability to break trees and, you know, run. You can hear the footsteps running. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like when you start believing that they're real, that's when they attack you spiritually. Once you give them the belief, that's what happened to me. I believe what I was witnessing was real, and boom, that was it. That was a spiritual opening. Next, you know, I'm walking to the store, and I hear footsteps running, and as I'm turning, boom, impact on my back. I go flying four or five feet, tuck and roll with my guards up. There's nobody around me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got dropped numerous times like that. I went through a spiritual battle there in Elms Grove, but with his demonic forces, you know, whether however you want to see them through, there's shape shifting or but you know it comes from the same source i'm just glad i left i left that area but mm-hmm. it doesn't matter where you go they still follow <laughs> you know it's a spiritual thing so that's why i do my works that i do you know spiritually mm-hmm. kind of like i'm here i'm talking to you and I, and I just i heard a woman's voice say something <laughs> i don't you know, know you know i i take a lot of flack for this but I'm not one that believes in in mind speak only because I don't believe that it is a Bigfoot or a dogman that is talking to you. I believe it's more on the demonic side because yes. what, what do demons do? You know, they will come to you, um, somebody or something that you want to see, you know, an elderly person, a child or, you know, people go out and they want to see Bigfoot or, or whatever. And they believe they truly believe they're talking, you know, hearing hearing a Bigfoot. I don't believe that. I believe it's a demonic and they're, you know, you're opening mimicking. Up to them. They're mimicking, they're mimicking voices. Mm-hmm. You, I was here the, when I lived there, the little children running around my home at three in the morning, mm-hmm. little kids playing around my home. I was like, wait a moment. I go out there, walk around my home. There's no kids. I go back inside to my room. Then I hear them by my window and I could see like silhouettes, like there's kids by my window and I go outside and there's nobody there. So I just do the side of the cross. I get my holy water. When I used to live there and I would just spray around my home, pray, place crosses, holy crosses on the doors and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Those little kids, they're actually demonic beings going over there around three in the morning trying to mess with me, you know, trying to lure me to go outside. Right. right. Yeah. So, my, my, my mom always taught me that when I was a young kid. She was like, you know, um, the devil's not going to really come at you with, you know, the pitchfork and the horns mm-hmm. and the tail and all that. He's going to come at you as a being of light, you know, something that you're familiar with and comfortable mm-hmm. with. Because Absolutely. if you scare it, if you scare your prey off, you know, it's just like hunting or, or anything like that. If you're going to, you're not going to go out hunting and bang symbols and scare your, your prey away. You're going to try to lure it in, whether it's through a deer feeder or whatever it is. You know, so it's the same kind of concept. He'll come to you as, you know, the angel Lucifer, not as the the devil that he became, you know, or the hostile mm-hmm. that he became. You know, yeah. So, so, yeah some I of the EVPs that I will catch there in Elm's Grove was crazy because you could hear like an army of them saying, talking a different language. Like you could hear them chanting something like an army of many. You know, when I was fighting spiritually, I just wouldn't tell nobody what I was going through because, you know, I didn't want to put nobody in danger. You know, there was going to be some danger happening to somebody. It would be me, you know, but I'm glad that I overcame that. But this is why I created my, my site to hit. First, I created it was called positive spiritual. I created it to as a document of what was I was going through. But then I created spiritual crypt and accounts and I like helping out people spiritually. And that's why what, what the works that I do is help out people spiritually. I don't want nobody to go through what I went through, even though people are going to go through things. You know, I can help, you know, I, I'll give them the remedy of if it's something demonic to say, I rebuke you, I type by rebuke in Jesus Christ's name, and they'll flee, they'll disappear. I did that to test when I see the dog man again that was in the form of a werewolf. And I said, I type by rebuke in Jesus Christ's name, it just vanished and it left the like a white smoke and it smelled like sulfur. I had seen a, 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 a what looked to be a Bigfoot. It, it was coming straight at me. It was very big, probably like 15, 16 foot tall. And 
it brushed right against me, went right through me. When that happened, I started acting weird, like something was trying to uh, possess me. So I kept on going to prayer. A lot of bad thoughts were coming to my mind. And I went to to sit on the park bench. And I, I kept praying and praying and praying till I felt better. Uh, but I could see how they could easily mistake it for a big creature. But, you know, we call them bulto negros, dark shadows, you know, that are massive, you know, which are demonic of nature. I, I believe that's what I ran into because it went, I thought it was gonna, it was gonna hit me, but it went, went right through me. It went past, past me right by, because we brushed, I was going out of the woods onto the highway and it was coming in into the woods. And we brushed against each other, but it didn't knock me back. It went right through me. So that's what I, I believe that there are, are, you know, what people, they're from another dimension or to me, they're demonic in nature, you know? And I yeah, don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just talking about the experience of what I've experienced, you know, uh, of what I've witnessed. You know, I, I faced them, and uh, the only way I could fight them was not through weapons, because I had weapons, you know, prior military. That wouldn't work. You know, if something, they probably try to make me use it against me. Uh, the only thing that I found to be able to work is fight against them spiritually, you know, and that's how it came on. That's the, I agree with that too, Abe, and I, I want to say something real quick here. Um, I agree with what you're saying, that, that the, the spiritual battle is where it's at. That being said, like, Krista, you said something interesting, and I, I don't think I've ever really discussed this too in depth with you, but you said you don't believe in the mind speak, and your reason is that you believe that um these things it's it's demonic right that that, that, that that's i do i do believe that people are hearing things you know like that they are talking to something i just don't believe that it's a bigfoot i just you know how did the demonic get you you know that they they come to you um as either somebody that you trust or that you love or you know a lot of these people they go out in the woods and they want to see a bigfoot you know so they opened up the door and that's easy easy target and you just opened up the door and invited it in. That's my opinion, but no, no, it's, it's okay to, to be wrong. Let me tell you, I'm joking. I'm kidding with you. <laughs> I, I don't know the right or wrong. I'm yeah. just messing with you. So, yeah. so let me ask you this though, Krista. Like, so in your opinion, are Dogman and Bigfoot, and it's never that cut and dry to me. But do you think that they're flesh and blood, and that people are being manipulated into thinking they're talking to them, or? It is a demonic manifestation that, that is appearing as a dogman or a Bigfoot. I honestly, I don't know. I, I, what I saw, I saw a shadow of a Bigfoot and that was a hundred percent flesh and blood. However, I've seen orbs and I've seen all kinds of weird things out in the woods too. So I think they can be both, honestly. Yeah, me too. What are your thoughts on that, Monica? <laughs> I agree that it could be both. And, um, and I also agree with the mind speak uh, that Crystal is talking, or Crystal, I'm so sorry, Krista is talking okay. about. Um, I just, I, I believe that you go out looking for something and, you know, I, I believe that there are entities all around us. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the negative ones are gonna take advantage of the situation. Uh, at any given time. I talked with Brandy about this last night on our show uh, where you have reports of children haunting areas or mm. children's spirits somewhere. And I just have a really hard time believing that there are that many children that are left behind because they're the innocent, right? Mm. So why are there spirits? I don't believe in children's yeah, spirits. I, I don't either. I, I think that that's something them. trying to trick you. Yeah, yep, absolutely. A hundred percent. And as far as Dogman and Bigfoot being demonic entities versus flesh and blood, um, I agree that it could be both. Um, because what I experienced with that, that just that evil feeling and sensation just constantly washing over me during my experience, I, I don't see how a flesh and blood creature could do that. Right. So, well, I'm, you know, the, the logical side of my mind is like, it's got to be flesh and blood. You know, the, the, the part of me that experienced it is thinking there's, there's no way, like, how is that possible? Right. 
Yeah. So it would be like if if there was a dog man or a Bigfoot. I believe in mind speak, and I'll I'll tell you this is why. And it's not to to be uh, contrarian or anything like that. One of the things I think is that because these beings themselves are something akin to demonic. Um, mm -hmm. So when someone comes across a dog man or a Bigfoot, and they're like, "Oh, it was speaking to me," I'm sure it was. I mean, I don't don't doubt that. I mean. I've heard tons of stories. I've fielded so many reports, and we get lots and lots of stories. I woke up today with like six new ones before noon. Um, that was surprising. I usually don't get that many, but um, it seems like people know like the weekend. They're like, hey, he's really busy on Friday, so let's – I'm just joking. But I'm kidding. So let's just slam him with reports. But I woke up today, and I had a few of them, so I kind of passed them off to a couple of friends. I said, hey, this might be up your alley if you want to take on this or whatever. Um, and I hope that that's okay with the audience. If you don't, if, if you're not okay with that, then say, look, you know, you, you want it to me to tell the story, but I'm a little backed up. So sometimes um, if it would be okay, I wouldn't mind sharing the wealth and giving some of these reports to some other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's up to the audience and up to people. And if you're hearing this, you don't have to answer in the chat, but you can message me and tell me what you think, if it's okay, if I pass off the report, if I have, uh, if it's something, especially like I have a friend right now who's doing a, uh, He's looking for reports. His name is Edward Mongi, um, and he's doing a documentary, and he's looking for reports to do that's eventually a film. It's a film that's eventually going to be on TV. So it might be something you're interested in. I'm also, I also have a friend who's a producer at Expedition X who's looking for reports. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in being and doing something like that, maybe I could pass it on to them, and they could, they could uh, take it over. Um, but that's up to you guys. And some people just say, hey, I want you to tell my story. I could tell it too and then still pass it on to them. It's up to you guys. But uh, it's whatever you guys want. It's it's really not my show. It's it just I'm the I look at it like I'm the steward, the custodian of this. And I don't look at these reports as mine because some people in this field, um, they will take a story and be like, this is my story now. And I'm like, what? Uh, <laughs> unless you wrote it with your fake AI BS, and how is that your story? Because somebody gave you that story, then they're like copywriting the story, which should be a red flag to everybody. Like, how are you going to copyright a story that somebody gave you? Because wouldn't that not really be your story? Like, right. that's kind of weird to me. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Call me crazy. Call me old fashioned or whatever. But I think that that kind of means that it's actually your story, you know, which means that yeah. you fictionally made it up or something. I don't know. But, yeah. uh, That's like watching Young Guns and being like, I own Billy the Kid's story now. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him jump out of a, of a trunk and come out. You know, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen that show, Righteous Gemstones, but there, there's this scene on there. And I'm not going to give it all away, but there's, I think it's like in the third season. It's That's Eric cool. Andre, and he's a ridiculous comedian. But uh, him and his girl are like, you know, they're getting ready to face these people with guns. And, and so they're getting all drunk and hyped up. And so she falls out of the, the, uh, the top story window in a trunk. And so it's not like where Billy the Kid pops up and shoots, you know. Like, <laughs> he stands up and she's like, like oh, that's uh, I'm falling in this trunk. And they just kind of look at each other and they just start shooting her. And, like, he was all jacked up. So it's like, yeah, movies don't always translate to real life, or, or usually they don't at all. But uh, just a word to the wise. Uh, but it's a really? funny show. Righteous Jim Stones, Danny McBride's. Uh, oh, it's right? hilarious, dude. He's funny as hell, dude. But uh, yeah, I uh, love comedy. If I get a chance to watch something, you know, I'm probably going to look at something comedic because I'm just, I just can't. I'm so sick of the world, you know. Um, <laughs> When you look at this, uh, the, the mind speak thing, right? So you get these stories, and I always go back to this one particular case where the child was was talking to a big uh, dog-like being, um, and it was telling him, not with its mouth, but it was mind speaking to him, come outside, come outside. And he was being terrorized by this the shadow being that, that was the hat man. We figured it out pretty quick that it was it wore this saucer, like flying saucer-looking type hat. Mm -hmm. um, when he drew the picture of it, it looked like a flying saucer on top of somebody's head. Like, it was weird. Um, and I said, that, that's that got to be the hat man. We all looked at it and said that. But this being that was telling him, yeah, I could protect you from the other being, come outside, you know. Um, 
Yeah, that that right there. Now, I, I did a story recently called the, the Horrors of Petra, the Forbidden City, which is in the Levant. And of course, it's in the, the, the country of Jordan. Um, the Jordanians, which are really not a people, they are a nationality, um, but they are a, a mixture of Bedouin and of people of Syrian descent going all the way back to the Roman times. And they don't really know. There's a lot of different <clears throat> versions of how that city came to be and why it ended up being uninhabited. And of course, the prevailing theme is the spooky one that the Jinn reclaimed it. And if you listen to some of the people who have been there and have had things happen there, you would think, yeah, that's probably what actually happened. But that particular place, there are many cases of people seeing what appear to be completely flesh and blood beings, but they're speaking to you through your mind. Mm -hmm. Of course, as Krista said, more than likely there's some sort of demonic manifestation. Mm -hmm. um, so I am in the same camp with you guys and including Abe. I do believe in mind speak, but I that's, what yeah, that's what happened to me when that day uh, that my sister woke me up and she said that there was a, a woman yelling for help. It sounded like somebody was doing something to her. It was like around three in the morning and I went outside, it was cold and I could hear a woman yelling for help. And my sister's there like crying and stuff. Go help her, go help her. You know, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're harming her, you know? So I'll go inside, put on my, my, my warm ups or, and I grab the bat and I go follow this, this voice, this woman yelling for help. And I go to the park towards the swing set and this, I'm by the wall line and I could hear the woman yelling from help from inside, you know, uh, she's saying, help me, help me, you know, and she saw the way she's screaming. It sounds real, real loud, but I could, I could, I could hear her say, help me, you know? So I go into the path. Uh, I go to, I'm getting close. I got my bat in my hand and I'm hearing her say, help me, you know, screaming. And as I'm fixing to swing the bat because I'm, I, it sounds very close, it stops. So I'm looking and I say, is anybody out here to see if I see any movement? And, you know, I don't hear nothing. And I'm looking around, looking around. Uh, I go look towards, uh, I walk forward and I walk towards the cre creek. You could see through the trees because of the, the leaves are off. I could see the, the club in the corner, this empty parking lot. And as I'm standing there, it's like something behind me. I sense something behind me, you know. It's like, oh shit. I'm like, excuse my language. So, oh shoot. Yeah, I, I felt that I was being set up, right? So when I turn around slowly, that's when I seen those those beings were very tall looking down at me. I could see white eyes. There was three on one one side of the pass and three on the other. I could see the dark silhouettes. They're looking down at me. So, you know, my main six tells me run to the creek or run to the highway. But then either way I go, this one's going to follow me or that's going to follow me. So I'm in a situation where I don't know what the, what I'm dealing with. I just see this big tarp figures that look like canine-ish or whatever looking down at me. Uh, they were probably like, I would say like eight, nine foot tall. That's all because they were looking literally down at me. So uh, I had to, I, I went into prayer, right? And, and that's my safe zone. So I was saying the Our Father. I say the Our Father numerous times, and I try to ignore them because they're looking at me. So then I, I just make the duck tunnel vision. I say, okay, the best way to me to leave is go right through them with no fear. So as I felt that I was in my safe place, you know, that I was – that I could feel the heavenly presence of angels around me, I started walking through them. As I was walking through them, they were turning their heads. And as I kept on praying, this is this is what they said through mind speak, you know, telepathically or whatever. They said, I was saying the, the deliverance prayer, the, you know, the Our Father of Lord in Heaven. They acknowledged that. And they said, the Holy One, the Holy One, all of them, were saying the Holy One as I was walking in between them. And I never turned back and I left the area, but that was my protection prayer, right? And it's got, they acknowledged the Holy One, you know, just like the Legion, 
acknowledge Jesus Christ when uh, from the man that was possessed. They knew who he was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got rather in the same place. So I do believe what you say is that they, they can speak, but it, it's more of a spiritual thing, you know, that they, 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 they can talk spiritually to you in that right. manner. Yeah. See, yeah, this right yeah. here, Abe, is why you need to have a YouTube channel. You need to come on and you need to have a set, you need to have a set time where you come on every week and you can talk about it because you you have a lot to say. Yeah. And folks, he comes on and he does it on Facebook, but you, you, look, look, we gotta we gotta start a movement, a push to have Abe start a Yeah, YouTube. I just <laughs> you know, I'm just a uh, no guy. I really don't I was trying to get the computer to work and I couldn't figure that out, you know. So <laughs> the only thing I got my phone here that's got like thirty six percent left. So, 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 Abe, what we need to do? You don't live far from us, so me and Joe, we talked about this by doing some investigating together and stuff. Yeah. And I'm curious. Yeah. I just got my two of my cameras. I need. I got two more. We're supposed to be getting, um, but we need to get over there, Joe, and and, and show him how to use that. Get him set up on right. YouTube, I'm so he it. can start. You know, and then I would love to see a show with you and Joe. You two yep. together, just maybe working, doing a collaboration together, because sure. you two have a lot of spiritual knowledge, a lot of information. I think it would be a, a, a big hit. I love to see collaborations. That's what I was telling Joe uh, about this last conference. Me and Joe were talking about that. The collaborations that come out of the conference are incredible. Yeah. It's an awesome thing Absolutely. to see Garitano working with Bettina and everybody working together and getting stuff done. This, this, you know, these, this what they call it narrative that they're trying to spin that I want to be the top dog or whatever. I don't do I don't give a crap. As long as the information gets out there, I'm happy. And I didn't jump into this because I'm needing money and I'm over here begging, but please more porridge. What, <laughs> this is complaints for the whole tail, you know, like I, 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 please God bless us. Everyone. No, dude, I'm not begging for anything. And I don't, I'm not asking. I just, all I want is for us to get along, work together and I ding, man, let's get it going. I mean, let's get it going because there's a lot of information out there that needs to be said. And then yeah. our audience is so smart. They come on here and they, you know, they, they, they say things like somebody was talking about Arachne and, and they were talking about the Jezebel Arachne, Arachne connection. And people know the story of Arachne. She's a Greek. It's a Greek myth, the weaver, you know, and how it goes back to the spider and everything. And the more people you talk to, the more you you learn, the more you, you know, you interact and, and my voice goes hoarse just, you know, by the end of the week. By the middle of the week, I'm already going hoarse. I talk to so many people. And so mm -hmm. I have this friend of mine. She's an Olympic medalist. She's an amazing person. Her name is Yvonne. Uh, her, her dad was African-American, and he but he married a German woman. And she's an amazing person. And they live in our neighborhood. And this is when these little German candies, they're eucalyptus. And, man, they really help the throat. But she can only get them so much because, you know, anything that's healthy coming in the country, they're like, hey, 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 hold on now, partner. How many cartridges is in that? And they're like, uh, none. Oh, well, you better put about 320 in there. Then we'll talk. See, that's kind of how the FDA works. I'm just assuming. I'm not 100%. But uh, um, you're, you're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was just thinking, you know, like, yeah, I see JRB says Jezebel was thrown out of the window and trampled by horses. And all that was left were skull and bones. Yeah. When you when you go back and you look at those stories and how they connect and they overlap, it's really, really amazing. And then what comes after? Uh, <laughs> is that the one that was in the tower? Yeah. Then what, what comes for her? The dogs eater. Mm -hmm. Dogs. You think regular dogs or was it something demonic? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's what, that, that is because... If you look at the stories, they're always like some anthropomorphic thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And somebody here says, uh, yeah, it says Chicago big, big D wag claim your destiny says you're right. Josh facts. And Brandon Coe says, Josh be the top dog. That's the thing though. I, I, I've never, I've, I've always been sort of an alpha type character, but I've never like craved power. I've never been like the guy that I want to be in charge because that's a lot of responsibility. I'd rather just everybody be able to do what they're supposed to do. But you end up becoming the one that has to take charge because people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but what I love to see is everybody working together for getting to the answers, getting to the truth. And I love nothing more than to be able to sit back and watch my friends on YouTube 
Um, mm -hmm. If I'm not, if I'm able to, you know, and checking out Tex and BMR and Barton and, and Kristen Brandy, and of course now Monica and Joe, I like yours. And, and of course, Abe, I get to tune in when I can for you guys. <laughs> you always have interesting things to say and you bring something to the table and it's always delicious. It's always amazing. And, and so I always, I want to be somebody that's a unifying force in this field. I'm not looking to try to be a dictator. I don't want to try to set the tempo for everybody or whatever. All I want to do is talk about this stuff because I'm very passionate about it. So, you know, I've read, 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 read lots and lots of stuff. And that's good to have that kind of knowledge. But what good does it do if it's up inside your head and you don't ever share it? You don't teach. I saw the people I watched right. that live and die and they never the, share it. The, the, the yeah. that's a that's a, a, a shapeshifter, a witch, right? Mm -hmm. I remember one evening I was uh, at the mobile home park and I was seeing the shadow figure walking down the street towards the park, you know, it looked like a form of a woman. So, I, you know, I was already fighting spiritually. So I did the sign of the cross and I started walking behind it, seeing where it was going. And as soon as it went into the park, it disappeared. But what happened was all on top of the trees. Well, I seen eyes of owls looking at me. There were a bunch of them. So I start praying to your father, and I just start walking backwards. They were all over in the trees. A bunch of a bunch of owls. You could see their eyes just looking at me. That night, I was hearing an owl just making a real loud. You know, it's like what is it? You know. Uh, so I went outside to try to scare it off from the tree or whatever that was there. You know, right. Over, my neighbors had a big tree. So I went out to scare it, and I went and went around the mobile home, and I seen somebody walking towards the park, uh, like a woman, but a like dark figure. I followed, and that's what I ran into. Nothing but owls looking at me. So to me, it felt brujas, lechuzas, that it was an owls, that many owls there, there was actually that many witches on the tree that they lured me out, <laughs> you know, trying to ambush me. So You know what those are. That's a harpy. Yeah, Those are the harpy. And, and according to the reason that they take that form, and this is what I believe from research, is because when the they walk funny when they're in the form, the, the, they walk funny. He's not bloody when, harpy. Whenever, whenever in Genesis, whenever the, the, the uh, sons of man or so, the sons of God came into God the daughters of man, man. Um, it talks about them like, you know, whatever, like breeding and creating this entire race of being. Of course, everybody talks about it, the Nephilim. But these these harpies, these the women yeah. that accepted the women that, that, that yeah that they gave birth yeah they became mm -hmm. the harpies right yeah that's right and and a lot of it goes back to Greek mythology and now somebody had attacked me up uh, this this crazy guy up in Oklahoma has attacked me about my use of the Greek mythology and most recently another crazy guy who pretends to be a fundamentalist Christian but I'm going to say something and I'm going to tell you why they're wrong because. A lot of the New Testament and some of the Old Testament is Platism. And now, if you don't know what that is, that's Plato and what he talks right. about. And people don't realize how much of the Greek Orthodox influenced and shaped the Bible, not just in the way that you say, oh, it's biblical. They, they did it in Greek translation. No, Byzantium. Now, it's all history. It's all history. The Byzant Byzantian Empire, which they didn't call it that, actually. They called it the Eastern Roman Empire, and it became the Orthodox. It was the founders of the Orthodox religion known as Greek Orthodoxy. Yeah. What we had in the West was Catholicism, and Catholicism came out of the Western Roman Empire, mm -hmm. which was the original Roman Empire. And, of course, you don't know Byzantium is not around anymore. Uh, the Byzantines are gone because Constantinople fell. To, it became Istanbul, and it fell to the to the Ottomans. The Ottomans or the predecessors. Ottoman of, Empire. Yeah. yeah, and so what ended up happening is you have Septuagint, you have all these different types of Bible, but those are the Greek versions of it that were passed down to us. Now, what ended up happening is <laughs> the Romans were assailed by the Vandals and the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and all these other kinds of people. And so over and over again, they were changed over and over and over. And the Bible was was corrupted over and over and over again from those early translations. And they were even at one point at sword point, they changed the Bible because the Goths had told them that, you the, you know, use that book to do what we want, you know. Um, and so but the Bible stayed the same for the most part until the destruction 
of Constantinople. So you had an emperor who came along, Constantine, and said, we're going to have one state religion. And he ruled from the East because the East had the very power, the powerful. Um, and it was the Greeks that kind of held sway. And so Plato, in, in his beliefs, passed down uh, from Socrates to him, to Aristotle, through Alexander and on into the Macedonians, which became Hellenism uh, in the Greek world. And then the Romans adopted it and so on and so forth. So you had this uh, retelling of the legends and myths of the ancient Greeks that were, you know, splattered around into the Bible, you know, and whatever. And it, it's because they're the same thing. And I'm going to tell you why. In, in Genesis 6, when it talks about mighty men, men of renown, you know who they're talking about? They're talking about the real-life Hercules. They're talking about Achilles, who literally lived and died. He fought at a battle that we know really happened at the city of Troy. And in the seventh level of the city of Troy, there were 11 levels. They went down archaeologically. Heinrich Schliemann, he found Troy and said that this is the actual city where Hector and Achilles lived and died, and that this actually happened. And the Romans, of course, they took on Aeneas. Aeneas was the one that escaped the destruction. He was the last of the Trojans. And they said, he is our, our forefather. We claim him as the whatever, just as the Spartans claimed that Hercules was their predecessor because he was the, you know, he wore the lion skin that he had defeated that lion um, that nobody could defeat the, the, what is it? The Numidian lion or what's his name? The Numidian lion. He defeated him. And of course he had all these great deeds. The Bible talks about it. It says they were mighty men, men of renown, and that they did all these amazing feats. And of course, Genesis six, you look at like uh, the, the Bible going on uh, through Enoch. Enoch became the long version of that. And then there's Enoch 2 and then Enoch 3. Right. And there's all these other things that came from that. So when you stop and you look and, and you, you go, why is it this way? Why did those beings, why were they the harpies? And why did these shape-shifting witches, these whatever, you know, skinwalkers, whatever you want to call them, why do they look the way they do? Well, I'm telling you, because there's a bloodline that they follow. And they're still representing the, their ancestral heritage of black dark magic, which to me is just black science. It is a science that has not, magic is just science that has not been discovered and we don't really know how it works. But one thing for sure is symbolism and sacred geometry, which is Pythagorean theory and all these other types of whatever you wanna call it, which is also Greek. Um, if, you, if you use those symbols, it does make things happen. And I've talked to abductees who have gone on board a ship. There was somebody from Buffalo, New York, not too long ago, who gave me a story. He was literally pulled out of his college dorm window in the middle of the night when he was going to UB. And he was taken aboard a craft. And on this craft, and he was hovering above the city. And he goes, I could look down and I could see where I was just sleeping. I was up above, you know, in this uh, uh, ship. You know, he goes, and he goes, and I see all these weird symbols. And the weird thing was, he was actually, he fell asleep while he was studying geometry. Now, Hello. conventional thinking will say this. Billy, that's his name, Billy fell asleep thinking about geometry. So guess what? He had a dream. He probably ate some of those delicious buffalo wings that the city is known for, right? That's why they're called buffalo wings. And he said, oh, man, I ate too much. And I'm this, this, this geometry, I'm going to pass out on, you know. Guess what? I wake up and I'm getting taken by these blue alien creatures, and now I'm seeing geometry in the, you know, in on the ship. Is that what happened? No. You know why? Because he told me something very interesting. He said I was just sitting there, I was stumped, and I was like using his protractor to try to draw some different, you know, whatever. And he drew an eight-pointed, an eight perfect eight-pointed star, and he began to look at it. And he goes, "Well, I was looking at it, I got drowsy." Well, he did something else he probably shouldn't have done. Um, he took too much Delta 9. Now, people are going to say, oh, well, there's the answer right there. Uh, Bill took too much, you know, or we'll call him William. Um, William took too much Delta 9, and he was playing around, with, you know, and he couldn't do whatever, so he fell asleep, and then he got abducted. The problem with that theory is that he's been being abducted since he was 8 years old, as far as he could remember. Now he's 20 years old, and he's being taken out of his uh, room or whatever. This was a few years ago, like in 2020. And I made a joke. I said, well, maybe you were just trying to get away from the 
stuff that was going on because you could, you know, couldn't go outside without wearing a face diaper. So you had to get abducted. So probably he made a joke back. He says, "No, nah, you know, I would think that." He said, "The problem, though, Wolf, is that I've been abducted since I was eight. And I said, "Okay, well, that changes things. This isn't something new. This isn't just happened, right?" And I said, "But you know what you were doing? You were." And he showed me a few of the symbols. And I said, you were inadvertently drawing them to you, you know, literally. Mm -hmm. If those were larger with a circle around them, you could have made a portal. Yeah. I'm going to talk about this on this show and tell you how to do it because sacred geometry is something that does work. But I'm not going to tell you how to do it because even though I've read books on this stuff that are this big, I don't believe in doing that because I think that if God wanted us to do that, we would know about it. I just saw a movie about that kind of stuff last night. I was like, what the hell is this movie about? It was like some statue things, and they had to put their head in there, and they were, they were, they were the pointing at like things. They're like a teaching you how to do it. <laughs> and I was seeing yeah. this movie, like, what's going on in this movie? Then at the end, it just forms like a pyramid of light, and it's like, oh, shoot. She went into a different dimension. Yeah, you know, and here's the thing. And, and I'm fixing to have to run here, folks, but here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Coming up pretty soon, I'm going to do a follow-up with Agnes. She's the one that, that she's Danish and Dutch, whatever, um, that had the experiences at the city of Petra. Something followed her home. Uh -huh. And it wasn't by accident. And I told her, I said it, but she went back. And I, I kind of did not realize at the time that, that why she went back was to try to make this thing go away. And she was told by someone on how to use sacred geometry, which was completely wrong. And I told her, I said, that was the worst thing you could have done because all you did was reaffirm and you gave them a portal to you. And I said, that was really, that was no good. Um, but she was listening to someone who claimed to be some sort of expert on it. And uh, so that's what ends up happening. So I told her this, I said, did it stop? She goes, no, it did not stop. Finally, when she figured it out, and she went and she, and I say this all the time, when she called upon God in the name of Christ, then she finally was able to get this thing off of her, get it away from her. And then it changed everything. Now, she battled these things for a long time. And I'm going to say this. Two of these beings had these diamond pyramidal shaped heads that would make her see like geometric patterns when she was asleep. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. Just like there's a reason why the Lachusa in our culture, Abe and I can say yeah. can attest to this, it looks like a harpy. As Joe, you you recognize it right away because we've talked about the the, the antediluvian and all that. You're gonna I, I have to make, understand something, folks. The world is not the way you think it is. And it, all it makes it sound this weird sound. The sound is yeah. yeah. That's the sound it makes. Mm -hmm. If it's a black one, don't whistle back because it'll, yeah, it'll come don't whistle back. You. That is a story. Back. We are taught that from when we were little children, right, mm -hmm. Abe? When you're a little, a little, a little a child, whatever, you're told. We we'll see you. Know, an adolescent, we'll you should already know that. If you're whistling back at as a child, you know better. But then when you get a little older and you're an adolescent, you're thinking, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to tempt fate and I'm going to yeah. whistle at this thing. Don't do you get it. Some cojones. Yeah, when you, get to, when, you, when you get when they drop and it's time to go. Hey, I'm gonna do this. Okay. Luckily for me, I guess luckily I saw a dog man and that was it. I knew better because I knew everything was real at that point. One of my cousins on my dad's side, who's completely Caucasian, he saw a, a lechusa come straight up in one of his trees, and then and it came down at him. He saw it drop down right in front of him. I mean, it was and then it was gone. Boom. Because he got scared and he threw a necklace at it, which was a cross. He had a cross. He's a Lutheran. He had the and he had just done his like they have their own version of like confirmation and all that. So he threw it and then he ran and it, it didn't follow him. Thank God. But you know when you stop and you look at these um, beings, what they are and 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 how they operate, it goes all the way back to ancient times. They haven't really changed their methods. We're the ones that are not figuring it out. That's right. the problem. So, folks, I got closing. Anybody want to close here? I mean, if you got something, say it quickly because we're gonna we're, we got to the three hour mark, and I am like beat. I can tell you, I got I still gotta go do my legs because that way I don't have chicken harpy legs. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta go do legs tonight. Yeah, it's been a pleasure though. I yeah. loved having everybody on. Uh, Monica, we got to get you talking. You're too reserved. You know, we got to loosen you up, and we got to get you all. 
ready to go it's because you do have a lot to say. Tonight that I'm dead tired. Yeah, is that <laughs> what it is? I have a really hard time staying awake. I'm so sorry because if you don't want to show up, you could just be like, "Hey, I, I can't make it." You know, that way you don't have to feel like you're forced to be here. No, I really thought make I could, but the more we were going on, and it, again, I love hearing all of the stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, Abe has incredible stories to to listen mm -hmm. to. And I, oh, I, yeah. uh, I've been through a lot, you know, it's like uh, all my life has been this way. So I'm a little bit different than everybody else. So I can go yeah, nowhere. Well, just going back when you were a child and you were basically used as a seer. I mean, yeah. that opened it up and you ended up with the, the, the Ojo Dotaro unexpectedly because they're always like, I mean, Ojo Dotaro, you know, yeah, it's a gift. It's a gift. Mentiras. It's not a gift when you're cursed with like a Patrika, they tell you and they put yeah. it on, you know, <laughs> but you went through it and you came out the other side and that's what's important. Anything else anybody want to say before we get out of here? Uh, yeah, I got I got two quick pieces. One is kind of off sides. It's pretty funny. Um, when we mentioned BMR, uh, he did that recent video on the um, I think it was either a Bigfoot or a Dogman of uh, Bear County. And for like mm -hmm. us Texans, we know. Yes, Bear County. But my wife, she's actually from San Antonio uh, Shirts area. So oh, yeah. she always calls it Bear County. And I make the argument it's Bexar County. You know, we live in Texas, so it's Bexar County. And she's like, no, it's not. So whenever he was on there, he's all, I was out in Bexar County. I'm like, see, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's like, it, Bihar, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but it, 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 start, it started the war all over again. I thought that was funny. But, um, <laughs> but my closing out, man, uh, thank you, Josh, and everybody for being on here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Um, God bless you all. Um, Keep searching for the truth because it's out there and there's no other way you're going to find it unless you're actually looking for it. So yep. I most appreciate it on everybody's end for joining in and having me join as well. So, yep. yeah, one love and God bless. The only, th the only thing I have to say is <clears throat> if you run into a situation, you run into something that's in a beastly form or whatever, don't, I would say don't be afraid and just remember you're not alone. You can always call upon Jesus Christ. Uh, type by the bigot in Jesus Christ thing, and hopefully whatever is there leaves. But when you do this, it's got to be done in in true faith and true belief. You know, you got to have faith in order for whatever is there to to leave. You know, that's how you put it to the test. That's all I have to say. And everybody have a beautiful, blessed evening. Amen. Yeah. Krista, you got anything to say? Yeah, I just appreciate you uh, allowing me to come on and and. Uh, sit here with everybody and, and um, learn. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank you to uh, all the new subscribers too from Blondes and Booze because I just looked a little bit ago and just from being on here tonight, we gained like eight. So I, we appreciate everybody. Yeah. And be sure and check out Blondes and Booze. I'm on there on Thursday nights. Uh, mm -hmm. We come on at eight o'clock and we go till 10 and they have some great guests. They always have some great guests. And uh, Monica, when is your show? Uh, when is that coming on? My show comes on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. She's um, one hour before we are. As, yeah. soon as, as soon as I'm closing out, Blondes and Booze are just kicking it off. So yep. we always encourage everybody to go over and listen to that. Watch <laughs> yep. Oh, hey, Josh, let me plug one more thing in real, just real quick. Sure. So for anybody in Central Texas, if especially if you're horror movie fans, um, Tomorrow and Sunday out at the gas station uh, off 304 in Bastrop. Uh, the dude that played Jason from part two is actually going to be out there hanging out and signing autographs and, and kicking it with the fans. So cool. if anybody who, yeah, if anyone of y'all dig um, old school 80s horror flicks, it's cool. going to be a big party. It's going to be dope. Very cool. That sounds cool. So everybody, just uh, be sure and, and tune in, like, and subscribe to these other guys' channels and gals. Uh, they're good people, or I wouldn't have them on here with the roundtable and the Paranormal Roundtable. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation tonight. Um, it goes in all different mm -hmm. directions. It goes all kinds of places. Um, I did have to, 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 to shut myself down for a minute. Um, I was still here listening, but I wanted you guys to talk and, and you know, and whatever, and I didn't want to be interrupting and 
I, I talk too much. Everybody knows that about me. And if I step on your toes and I apologize, I'm sure yeah. I'll get roasted in the comments. I don't read them most of the time, but sometimes I do. And I'm just like, damn, these people <laughs> ripped you up for talking too much. He's got a lot of knowledge, brother, and just letting it out so people can understand. Right. You know, it's good. Mm -hmm. And you guys do too. And I appreciate you being guests. And whoever wants to come back Friday, let me know. I mean, it's an open forum now on Fridays. We're just going to, whoever wants to show up and talk, and we'll have a different subject and a topic. And if you want to come on, come on. If you can't make it, well, you can't make it. And uh, we just have fun here at Paranormal Roundtable. That's what we do. Pray for peace, folks. We have people who don't want peace. God in heaven only knows their heart and knows why they want what they want. But here at PRT, we want peace. We want to be left alone. Um, you know, they want to do, they want to destroy us and take us down and all this other stuff. Why? Uh, you know, that's the big question. We just want to be left alone. And they've come up with every reason on earth from religion to politics to the Chicago fire. They can't really say why. But I believe that it is something evil that drives these people to do what they do. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that these people are evil, but I think that they have their, their motives are and that something's driving them. And when people want to destroy and take away from something that's trying to do positive and do good, um, they have problems. And the only way to solve those problems is to pray for them. And I really believe in the power of prayer. I'm a big believer in that. So if you could, guys, just pray and pray for peace and pray in earnest that God will touch their hearts and they'll just leave us alone. And if they go away and leave us alone, we'll, we'll leave them alone. And it, I'm, I'm, we're not the ones antagonizing. I promise you that's not the case. Um, go to PRT News. You'll see what's going on. There's screenshots of everything they're doing and saying. And we are trying to get them to just stop and leave people alone and quit harassing people and calling people, I mean, you know, and, and messaging people and just leave people alone. That's all we want. We here at PRT, we want peace. I wish the best for everybody, and I wish the best for our community. And that's what we need is a unified community, right? Amen. My peace. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, guys. I'll let you run. I'll see y'all later. Good night. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Uh so, folks, that was all of our friends here at PRT. Um, you know, I, I want you guys to, to understand something, you know, that we're not going to turn this into a platform to talk about all this mess that's going on. We're not going to do that. It's not going to happen. Um, I had to talk about it earlier in the live stream that I had to do an impromptu live stream. Boy, my hair looks terrible, doesn't it? And, uh, well, look at this. I got a pyramid head going over here. Look, it's a mohawk. <laughs> I should leave the hat on until I can fix it. But, Honestly, you know, we what we want is just peace. We want we want everybody to to just be left alone. We don't want problems. That's why I did a show about it earlier. Not a show, but a, you know, we talked about it and got it out there and whatever. Uh, if you want to know what's going on, like I said, go look at my Facebook. I got tagged in something and I let them put it on there. It was people making their statements about what is going on, and everybody's been asking me, and I have not gone into great detail with a lot of people. But one thing I know is that it is getting legal because I have turned it over to my lawyers. I have no choice. I ask these people many times to stop and leave us alone, and they just find it so intolerable. And they just continue to go to more and more people. I just got a bunch of people today that sent me more and more messages and screenshots. Just pray. That's all you can do. But we're not going to let that affect our show. And tomorrow night, we're going to talk about some stuff alien agenda and we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff and how it fits into the nature of reality and it's going to be fun it's going to be good like always and then sunday we're going to retell people's encounters and then of course tuesday we're going to have another good topic we're going to talk about either the horrors of petra part two what happened to this woman uh agnes or we're going to do the uh elves of inner earth either way it should be a great time thank you for everything thank you for those that donated we love you and good night